So without further ado, let's begin our presentation of a plenary talk. Uh, we have Lady Zinnick from the Meta AI Research Lab in the US, who will hold a presentation on modeling items to address our climate crisis. So I'd like to invite our speaker onto the stage. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you for having me here today. It's great to be here. It's an honor. So we think about the societal impact of AI. What is going to be the biggest impact? Is it going to be generating images? Is it going to be chatbots, large language models? Well, today I hope to convince you of two things. One is, is that the study of chemistry and the modeling of atoms if we can address this with machine learning, with AI, that this could have world-changing impact. And the second thing is, for the students out there, the ML researchers, et cetera, is that this is a really interesting problem. It's, a, it's an intriguing, uh, amazing problem to dive into, one that deserves more attention from the machine learning community. All right, so before we begin, Let's take a look at this science paper. And in this science paper, they were making a lot of bold claims. And they said, many statements you may think are of an alarmist order. Certainly they are depressing, but they are founded on stubborn facts. And it went on to say, all civilized nations stand in deadly peril. This sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? I mean, you think about today, we think about climate change, we think about how people are talking about AI. Uh, you know, this, this, this language sounds really familiar. But what's interesting is that this paper was not written today. It was written in 1898. So what were they worried about in 1898 that required this, this type of language? Well, they were worried about not having enough to eat. Our wheat-producing soil is totally unequal to the strain put upon it. You see, in 1898, they needed fertilizer for their soils. And what did they use for fertilizer back then? What was the best fertilizer? It was bird poo. And they mined this on islands all across the Pacific. But as you might not be too surprised if you're you know, knowledgeable about human history, we mined it till there was none left. And they were worried that we would not have a good replacement for that fertilizer, and that would lead to starvation. So who did they call on to save the day? Was it the machine learning AI researchers? No. It was the chemist. The chemist must, must come to the rescue, to the threatened communities. It is through the laboratory that starvation may ultimately be turned to plenty. And two scientists that came to this call were Haber and Bosch. They figured out a way to take nitrogen from the air, which is 78% of the air, and to combine that with hydrogen to create ammonia fertilizer. And what was the outcome of this breakthrough? They did thousands of experiments to come up with this, but what was the outcome? Well, we were able to grow the world's population, which was below 2 billion at the time, to nearly 8 billion today. That's nearly a five times increase in our human, in, in the number of people on this earth. I mean, you think about it. You're like, what is the, I, this has to be one of the biggest advances we've had scientifically, you know, as a human civilization. All right. So that was 1898. It's now 2023. What are the big problems today? Well, what's on top of many of our minds is climate change. And the good news is, is that the use of solar, wind electricity is on the increase. It's rising rapidly. But we still have a long way to go. We need to increase this by 6x. Now, 6x, it's not that bad. It's not 10x. You know, if we had 30 more years, I believe us as a human civilization, yeah, we can, we can 6x the amount of solar and wind that we are developing right now. But there is a catch. Here's an average day in California, electricity demand. It's lowest around noon, increases when people go home and turn on their TVs and turn on the AC. If you look at the solar and wind generation during that same time, it looks like this. 
Now let's say that we simply increase the amount of solar and wind by three times. What do we get? We get this. There's a problem here. <laughs> One thing is we have way too much electricity around noon. We're going to be basically throwing it away. And at night, when people come home, there's not going to be enough electricity to go around. What we need to do is figure out a way to transfer that electricity from noon when it's plentiful to later in the day when it's not. Or from a cloudy day to a sunny day, or from the winter, if you live in Seattle, to the summer. So how can we store renewable energy? Well, a couple ways that quickly pop to mind are batteries. We can pump water uphill. Uh, we can build more transmission lines. And all of these are good solutions, but they're limited. We need better solutions. We need solutions that can store even more electricity. If we want to do this at the grid, nation-side scale. And one way that does scale is we can take renewable energy, and let's say when there's excess electricity, we can use that with electrolysis to take a water molecule and break it apart. And then we can store that hydrogen. And then we can use that hydrogen later in a fuel cell to then generate electricity. Now, you all probably heard this story before. You know, oh, the hydrogen economy. You know, like, this is the way we need to, you know, like, this is our clean energy future. And you might be wondering to yourself, but why are we not using it today? Why is hydrogen not a thing? Well, it's simple. The fuel cells and the electrolysis are too expensive. These are chemical reactions, but they're too expensive. It's cheaper to burn natural gas. It's cheaper to burn coal. So how do we make these chemical processes less expensive? We need to find better catalysts. A catalyst is a material used to increase the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. If we could find cheaper, more effective catalysts, we could make the green hydrogen future a reality. All right, so I'm assuming that most of you here are not chemists. I know I wasn't. So let me just explain how a catalyst works and what it is. So here we have a Toyota Mirai. It's a hydrogen-powered car. Underneath the hood, there's a fuel cell. And on the fuel cell, there's a cathode where there is a catalyst. And that catalyst is performing a very simple chemical reaction. All you want to do is take an oxygen molecule along with some hydrogen and create two water molecules. Now, the oxygen molecule is what I'm going to call an absorbate. It's a molecule that interacts with the catalyst. And the catalyst here is a bunch of platinum atoms there at the bottom. So during the chemical reaction, what happens is that the oxygen molecule is going to float down onto the platinum catalyst. And when it does so, it bonds a little bit with the platinum catalyst, which weakens the bond between the two oxygen molecules, or two oxygen atoms. And that allows, when the hydrogen comes in, to more easily pull apart the oxygen atom. And same for the next oxygen atom. So what you can think of is the catalyst is essentially like a bond weakener. It makes that bond between the two oxygen atoms a little bit weaker, so the chemical reaction is a little bit more efficient, more cost effective. Now, the thing to know about catalysts is they have to be just right. If you have a catalyst that's too strong, the oxygen will bond to the surface, and the reaction will grind to a halt, because the surface of the catalyst will just be covered with oxygen. If you have another catalyst which is too weak, it's not going to do anything. So what you need is a catalyst that's just right. It attracts at just the right amount to make the chemical reaction move along quickly. The problem is, is that all the catalysts out there today that work for these reactions are really expensive. So how can we screen new catalysts? How can we discover new catalysts? Well, the way we do this computationally is we place an absorbate, that molecule, near the catalyst surface, and then we perform something called a relaxation. It's basically an atomic simulation where we basically compute the forces on the atoms using something called density functional theory, or DFT, and then we just basically run that simulation until we find a local energy minimum. You see here, like, the molecules are kind of, kind of gently hugged by the catalyst there. And then you compute the reaction rate, given that, that minimum energy. Now, the problem is, is that the, to perform that simulation takes one day of compute an entire day of compute, just to do that simple illustration that I'm showing right here, just to do that calculation using density functional theory. And there's billions of possibilities. So we cannot screen all these different materials just using traditional approaches. So the question arises, how can we reduce that computation, which currently takes a day, can we get it down to a second? 
So that way we can screen these materials in bulk. Well, the solution to this problem could be using machine learning instead of DFT. So can we use machine learning to approximate density functional theory? So what is the actual problem? If you're a machine learning researcher, what are the inputs, what are the outputs? It's actually really simple. The inputs are the 3D atom positions and their atomic numbers, which element they are. And we've generated a massive data set for training, int meta, called the Open Catalyst 2020 and 2022 data sets. We have devoted over 500 million hours of compute to create these data sets, because like I said, DFT is computationally really expensive. And it's one of the reasons that we embarked on this project is because we felt that we were the only ones that had the compute available to do these calculations at mass scale, and we were willing to open source it. The output, a single number, which is the energy of the overall system, and the forces on each atom. So a three-dimensional vector on each atom, the forces, which way it wants to move. That's it. That's the inputs, that's the outputs. You don't need to be a chemist to understand this. You don't need to be a chemist to study this problem. You just need to know that those are the inputs, those are the outputs, and as, from a machine learning perspective, this is a very approachable problem. So the way we study this problem is typically we use a graph neural network, where every node equals an atom, every edge equals a neighbor, and then basically the main thing here is we have an embedding for every atom, and then we pass messages between the atoms here, M, to basically update the node embeddings to then compute the forces and the energies. And the message, the, the M here, the message, is essentially a neural network. So how do we compute M? How do we compute that message? I'm just going to give you a little taste of it right now, but I don't have enough time to go into a lot of technical, technical details. So the first thing we know about this message is we want it to have a certain property, which is equivariance. And if you're equivariant, what that means is if the input is transformed, you want the output to be similarly transformed. So let me just give you a quick example. So if we want to have translation equivariance, let's say we have a function which can segment a dog out of an image, is if we translate that image, we apply the same function, we translate it back, we should get the same segmented dog as we did if we did the original segmentation. So why do we want translation equivariance in images? Why is that important? Is it because of some underlying physical property? No. The reason is it's more efficient. We don't want to have to learn a dog detector for that bounding box, and that bounding box, and that bounding box, and that bounding box. We just want to learn a single dog detector that works over the entire image, right? So the way we do this in images is we use something, as you probably all know, called a CNN, where we break the image up, and then we basically run a function at every single spot on that grid to come up with a response map. So that's our intuition for how we do image recognition in images. Can we apply the same type of thinking you know, to atoms? Well, with atoms, we don't care about translation equivariance. We care about rotation equivariance. So we have a bunch of atoms. We have some function that, let's say, computes the forces. If we rotate those atoms, use the same function to compute the forces, rotate it back, we should get the same result. The one thing to know about atoms is that relative orientations, they matter a lot. So you have a CO2 molecule, we have a carbon, you have two oxygen on the other side, kind of makes sense, they you kind of balance each other out. So you would think that a, a water molecule would look like this, with an oxygen in the middle and two hydrogen on either side, right? But as probably most of you know, it doesn't look like that. It's got the, oxygen you know, the hydrogen molecules up here, the atoms up there. Reason for that's a little complex, I won't go into that right now, but the take home is, is that the angles matter. So when we think about representations for a network, an image is a bunch of 2D planar representations. For atoms, we care about the relative information around the atoms, you know, the different orientations. So a representation for atoms is going to be a sphere. So we have a spherical function around the atom which encodes what information exists in every different orientation relative to that atom. So how do we represent that? Well, we could use a discretization like we do in images, but that's kind of clunky. So instead, we use something called spherical harmon harmonics. So we have that function, and we're going to represent it using a set of coefficients with a set of basis functions, y, where the basis functions are the spherical harmonics, which look like this. So 
What this means is that we can, re we can represent an arbitrary function using a set of coefficients multiplied by those basis functions to represent that function. But what's really cool about spherical harmonics, and the reason why we use them, is you can take those same coefficients and you can multiply them by something called a Wigner-D matrix. And what happens when you do that? You can rotate the function in an arbitrary way. And this property, this mathematical property of these functions make it an ideal representation for studying atoms. And you can build all sorts of neural networks on top of this. And it's a really fun and a, like a, just a great playground for studying new machine learning models. All right. So let's look at if we use these sort of models using spherical harmonics. What type of accuracies do we get? Well, back in the day, uh, 2018, which seems forever ago, we got models which had accuracies like this. The next generation of models got a little bit better. And the ones using spherical harmonics and different representations are doing even better today. So it's kind of like we see across deep learning, you know, this slow improvement in accuracy. And just to give you some qualitative sense, look at this. On top, the ESCN is a machine learning model of how the atoms interact. Below is a DFT ground truth. What you'll notice is the atoms are behaving in a very complex way. They're moving around in all sorts of different ways. But what's being predicted by the machine learning model and DFT are nearly the same. It's doing a good job at approximating. Here's another example. And in this case, machine learning model actually finds a lower energy solution. And this isn't too unexpected. A little bit of noise in the system, you know, you could be at a saddle point and you go one way or the other. And it doesn't always work. Here's a failure case where the machine learning model, it's looking really good. It's about the same as the DFT approach. But at the very end, that hydrogen atom kind of sneaks away from the rest of the molecule. So that's a failure case. So it doesn't always work. So one thing, so what we just talked about was to do a relaxation. So we have an absorbate. We want to see how it relaxes onto the catalyst surface. But if you place that absorbate in a different location and relax it, you get a different answer. We do another one, you get another answer. And what you really care about for practical applications is which is a global minimum. So the way we do this now is we can use ML relaxations to perform, you just randomly place that absorbate on the top of the catalyst, perform a whole bunch of ML relaxations, find the one with lowest energy as predicted by the machine learning approach, and then you just do a single DFT call to refine the energy estimate. And by doing this ML plus DFT type approach, it can be 700 to 1,000 times faster than using DFT alone. That's a huge speed improvement. So speed improvement, that's cool, but how accurate is it? Well, let's look at the success, and the success is just like, is the energy within a certain threshold of where it should be? Pretty tight bounds. And the force MEE is what I showed before. It's like the, the mean absolute error on the forces. The old models had very little success. The next generation of models got a little bit better. But remember how I showed you the forces on the latest generation of models, the force MAE was getting just a little bit better. It seemed like, you know, a little bit better. But when you actually apply it to a real application like this, we've seen a dramatic increase in the success. What this means is that nearly 90% of the time, we can use ML models as a proxy with a little bit of DFT to find the same answers that chemists were doing before much, much faster. And it must always be successful. And to enable the community to do this, because from a chemistry perspective, not all of them have a lot of GPUs, they might not be familiar with using GitHub, is that we put this uh, demo out there so that way people can try out these models themselves, even if they don't have the background in ML. So that way more people can take advantage of these models. So let me just go through quick what it means to screen a new material. So let's say I have a big chunk of stuff, and I want to say, is this going to be a good catalyst? What do I actually have to do? Well, the first thing you have to decide is how to slice the material, because the catalyst is like a 2D surface. So you can slice it on this side, you can slice it on that side, you can slice it here, you can slice it there, you can slice it up there, and you can slice it down there. A lot of different ways of slicing it. Most material is about 90 different unique ways of slicing it. Usually in a chemical reaction, it's not a single absorbate. There's usually five or more. And for every single absorbate, you have to you know, try different locations on that surface until you find the global energy minimum. So putting this together, how many relaxations do you actually need to perform? Well, there's 90 slices, 5 absorbates times 100 placements equals 45,000 relaxations. That is a lot, of, a lot of compute. If you did this with just CPUs, 
it would take you 120 years. That's why people didn't use this approach. It's easier, faster, cheaper to just try to do the material in the lab. But using machine learning and DFT together, we can do this in two and a half GPU days and 70 CPU days. Still a lot of compute, but it took something that was not possible before, and now it made it possible, especially if you have a lot of compute on hand. So how many known materials are there out there? Well, if you look at an open source database like the Materials Project, there's 150,000, approximately. If you look at a chemical reaction that we are currently interested in, that would be stable under the reaction conditions, there's about 6,000. What this means is, is that instead of how you would do it before, which is like you use your human intuition to figure out which material do you want to try next, is that we can just brute force calculate the properties on every single one of these materials. And that's changing how we think about chemistry and how we perform these problems, is instead of, you know, kind of searching the space here and there, we can just try everything. Now, this would be really cool, except for there's one other thing that you need to know about the chemistry community. You have the experimental chemist who do work in the lab, and then you have computational chemists who do the work on the computers. The experimental chemists are pretty skeptical of the computational chemists. And you know who they're even more skeptical of? the machine learning people who are trying to approximate the computational chemists. So the only way that we are actually going to make true change is if we can show that our computational models actually work in the real lab. And we're working really closely right now with the University of Toronto to do a large-scale experimentation of different materials on different chemical reactions to find out if these computational models predict the experimental results. And this is a really exciting area. Now, I mentioned before that there's 6,000 materials out there that fit the criteria, right? So it's actually likely that we're going to run out of materials to test. So this is an exciting area. I think Connor mentioned it earlier today as well. He's using generative AI to generate new materials to then try. So this is an exciting new area. So what are some other challenges? So if I asked you what percentage of our simulations, those relaxations I was showing you, are close enough, what percentage would you say? At the beginning of the project, we were at 0%. Now, 16. <laughs> eh, it's something. Could be better. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because if we don't use DFT, we still have a long ways to go. There's still a lot of good research to be done here. Still a lot of excitement in this area. And right now we're modeling pretty simple systems like this one. Clean surface, a little absorb rate on top, but real world systems are much more complex. We want to have a lot more atoms, a lot more complexity to it. And the other thing is that reactions happen really quickly. Experimental results happen really, really slowly. DFT simulations are really, really slow. ML, a little bit faster. But there's still a big gap between what happens in a reaction and how fast we can compute things. So if, if we can make these algorithms more efficient, make them scale better, we can help close that gap. And then other areas. I mentioned climate change. I mentioned renewable energy storage. That's a big problem. Unfortunately, we've already put a lot of CO2 into the air. We need to find ways to get it back out. Direct air capture is one of those possibilities. And the IEA predicts that by 2050, we'll need to have the capability to pull out a billion tons per year. That's a huge amount. So one thing we could do is we could use direct air capture. So direct air capture, essentially you put a bunch of air into a box, you have something called a sorbent, and the sorbent, think of it as a sponge, basically sucks that CO2 out, and then CO2 depleted air comes out the other end. Once the sponge becomes full, you close up the system, you heat it up, and you release the CO2, hopefully you store it somewhere, and then you repeat the process. The trick is, is you have to have a sorbent which is attracted to CO2, but not attracted to other molecules like water. So just like catalysts, we have to measure how much like a certain material attracts or doesn't attract certain molecules. And just 
Last week, I think it was Thursday or Friday last week, we just announced the OpenDAC data set, which is a large-scale data set of sorbents for direct air capture to help kind of turbocharge in this area. Another, I think we spent, you know, 100 million hours or more of compute on this data set as well. And there's even more areas. There's the study of batteries. There is proteins, the drug discovery, which Connor mentioned earlier. There's a lot of exciting areas here. Um, hazardous waste cleanup. And there's even consumer electronics. A lot of different applications there that are important, you know, to Meta, important to Samsung, I'm sure, uh, in studying this problem. But the way that I look at this is what we're developing is kind of a fundamental scientific technology. It's kind of like building a new microscope. You're giving scientists another way to look at the problem. You're giving them tools that they didn't have before. You're taking something that would take a grad student, you know, weeks, months, years, you know, to, to develop or to, to measure, to, to study, and you're giving them the capability to do that in an afternoon. That changes how the way that people do science. And I think that's going to have a ripple effect in these technologies, in material science, in chemistry. So one thing I want to mention is that, you know, things aren't always good. I mentioned before Haber and Bosch, how this is an amazing scientific achievement. Well, it's worth noting that the same exact, or essentially the same exact technology helped actually prolong World War I because it's Developing explosives, ammunition, is very similar to developing fertilizer. And you use the exact same technology for both. And today, we have so much fertilizer that we're overusing it. This is creating ocean dead zones. So as with any technology, we need to be careful how it's used. So just to conclude, I want to just ask that question again. Why chemistry? A lot of you might be thinking about large language models, computer vision, that sort of thing. But why should we be working on chemistry? The short answer is, is it matters. The world needs it right now. We need to address climate change. There's a lot of important problems here. The challenges, the scientific problems are interesting. We publish in NARIPS, we publish in ICML. Like, the machine learning conferences are eager to see research in this area. This is a great place, a great time to be researching this space. And personally, I'm doing it and Meta's doing it because we feel like we're uniquely positioned to tackle this problem. We have an open lab where we can bring people together, we can open source these tools, and hopefully we can have an impact. And with that, thank you for the talk. Thank you very much. For delivering that inspiring words to us. So, or oh, maybe you would like to have, well, collect some questions from the floor. So if you have any questions, please raise your hands. Uh, so um, thank you for your uh, great presentation. Uh, I was um, uh, quite curious about uh, one thing that uh, you mentioned, a lot of the, uh, the environmental issues so that you have to deal with a, um, to find a new greener way of fi uh, finding new materials catalysts. But I was wondering uh, that the machine learning, uh, the training itself is now a very, um, <coughs> um, uh, very uh, famous of making in the CO2 emissions right now. So. Uh, I was curious about uh, what, what is the META's uh, current policy of uh, reducing the carbon emissions of uh, the machine learning itself uh, alongside with the using machine learning to reduce the green, greenhouse emissions. Uh, yeah, in that kind of things. Yes, no, it's an important point. Uh, machine learning uses an immense amount of power. And when using that much electricity, it's going to have CO2 repercussions. Now, Meta has made various CO2 pledges, you know, by 2030 to be, uh, to basically be carbon neutral. Uh, and the way that we're currently dealing with this is by purchasing renewable energy uh, offsets to handle this. Now, the challenge is, 
is how do we, you know, as a community, and as we use more machine learning, and as we, you know, have more power consumption, how can we meet that power demand in a way that's not going to raise our carbon dioxide levels? And I think that's why looking at these different approaches, using hydrogen, using other renewable energy sources, et cetera, is going to be really critical to make sure that we can scale and that we can basically make AI and machine learning something that's accessible to everyone in a way that is sustainable. So I think it's really important for us to be doing the research today that we're doing to make sure that this is something that, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, when this becomes a broader technology, uh, that we can meet that demand in a sustainable way. Well, thank you very much for that great presentation, uh, quite, quite a session as well. So thank you very much. That wraps up. Thank you. Well, our next session one will be held. So we are introducing uh, Kyung Hyun Cho from NYU, who will hold a presentation beyond test accuracies for setting deep neural networks. Kyung Hyun Cho could not attend today. So now we're going to um, ask him that through online presentation. So please welcome him with a big round of applause. Well, hi. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and I, I really apologize for not being there in person and giving this talk in re, uh, remotely. But hopefully, at the, uh, I'm going to be able to tell you a bit about you know, what I've been doing, as well as see what the whole community of machine learning researchers who are working on language models uh, recently have been looking into during the next, let's say, 20 to 25 minutes. So uh, in order to talk about what kind of, let's say, research directions uh, we believe that the machine learning needs to move forward, in addition to you know, the, what Larry just pointed out, to solve the problems that we really don't know how to solve, but they're really existential to the humanity, including the drug discovery, molecular disco uh, design, as well as material design. Um, to do so, we have to go back to actually 2015. So in 2015, if I recall correctly, the ICML happened, and then Leon Botu was one of the keynote speakers. And Leon, in his talk, described what was the main driver behind the enormous success already by then by machine learning. And then that enormous success was thanks to this one single experimental paradigm that is called validation or the train test separation. And then this single paradigm has literally driven the entire field of the machine learning over the past several decades. Now, what is this single paradigm? In this paradigm, somebody is going to collect the data for us, or sometimes we can go collect the data, but most of the machine learning scientists are not as, let's say, uh, brave as Larry and Larry's team, uh, in a sense that we tend to just work on the data that somebody else has collected for us. Now, given the data set, we're going to take about 80% and then call it a training set, and we're going to use a 10% to select the model or the select the algorithms. And then we use the final 10% that has been held out throughout the entire process to check how well the model generalizes or the trained model generalizes to new instances. And then if this new model that has been trained on the training set and was selected on the validation set generalizes well or better on this test set, then other models or the existing approaches, then we say that this some progress has been made. And that's been going on and on ever since late 80s. Now, what Leon actually told us in 2015 was that the, this experimental paradigm was reaching its limits. That is that the, we cannot simply rely on this paradigm that has been driving the whole field of the machine learning anymore. Now, Leon told us about this in 2015. Of course, no one really listened to him. And that's almost always the same with whatever the Leon tells us. Leon already told us in 1997 or 80, if I recall correctly, on a very detailed technical report why we want to rely on stochastic gradient descent. And the stochastic gradient descent on its own is a really great algorithm that, in fact, almost always converges very rapidly to one of the extreme points that we want to converge toward. But then you know, it took us until uh, about 2011 to realize that indeed that was a great idea. So similar thing. So Leon told us that this paradigm was reaching its limit in 2015, and we really didn't listen. Now back then, 
what uh, what what kind of things that he came, uh, you know told us as a way to go forward was to in fact we have to get out of this unusually convenient experimental paradigm and then try to look at the how the machine learning systems are deployed and then what are the cases in which this machine learning system fail more carefully in order to ensure that we are not going to waste the next several decades and then in particular it's going to be a waste in terms of our increased ambition, such as big data and artificial intelligence. Now, of course, big data back then, it was a big, let's say, thing still, but no one really talks about big data anymore. But artificial intelligence, in particular with the recent advances in, let's say, large-scale language models and whatnot, really has become a real thing. And in order to push it forward, it looks like we are really at the point where we cannot simply stick to this paradigm of the train test split that is trying to measure how well our systems are doing based on a static test set that has been collected long time ago. So how are we going to do that? Let's talk about this you know, the tested accuracy as a one and only criterion a bit more carefully. So the goal is for us to know that whether we are making progress or not. But then the goal is to check that in the context of how well these models are actually used. Now, before, before, until now, what we've been doing is that, okay, somebody's going to collect the data, there's a data collection, and then given this data, we're going to use the 80% or so of the training examples to train a model, that is to minimize a loss function. Now, I know that the, everyone was listening to Yashua, I was also listening to Yashua uh, earlier today remotely as well, and then he told us that, yes, we have to be more Bayesian so that we can actually marginalize over all the primers or the theories uh, you know, according to their posterior probabilities. But, you know, that's a great idea that's probably going to happen at some point with a better algorithm such as a generative, uh, what was it, like the flow network. But for now, for now, a lot of those uh, things are somewhat out of touch. They are often intractable and we don't really have a tractable, let's say, mechanisms to reach that goal yet. So for now, we're going to simply minimize a loss function that is computed on a finite set of the training examples. And then we're going to find the solution to any new instance using an inference algorithm that corresponds to minimizing an energy function. Here again, we do want to marginalize out all possible ways in which the solution can be achieved, uh, reached. But let's say, you know, we do it somewhat approximately in a maximization or the minimization sense. And then at the very end of the day, what we do is to compute the accuracy on the test set. Now I said validation set, sorry about that, they should be tested. And then that's how we know that whether this model works well or not. But if we want to go beyond asking for this, just checking the test accuracy as Leon suggested in 2015, we have to go one step deeper. And then what does that mean? When we collect the data, there's a one more step, but you know, I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, so because there is a loop that actually allows us to collect the data better, but there's the kind of active learning side, I'm going to skip it for now. But once the data is collected, before we start jumping into this process of training, we have to build a model. And then what do we mean by building a model? It's not just building a neural net, uh, deciding on the neural net architecture or deciding on the particular optimization algorithm or deciding on the particular set of deregularizers that are available already out there. Rather, what we mean, is, what we mean by model construction is to decide on a set of assumptions that are going to affect the downstream accuracy as well as the downstream procedures. So that's the part that we need to now really take a deep look at it. And then after the model, uh, when we think about the lear going from learning to inference, that is after training a model to using this model, in fact, it's not just a one shot, but there's a whole process of the optimization and also the hyperparameter optimization that is equivalent to model selection. And then here, we're not really only worried about the end result of the optimization, but we start need, uh, we have to now look at the process or the trajectories by which we arrive at these solutions. And once we know how to do the infer, uh, once we have a model, going from the inference procedure to evaluation is also not just a single step black box. Rather, how we use these models for the inference tells us a lot about the, how these models actually are working and then what kind of weaknesses and strengths these models possess. And then now, this 
process going on, uh, process of using a model is also somewhat of an optimization. And then you had the, I heard that you had the, many of the LLM researchers nowadays read this optimization as reasoning. And then this is the part that I'm going to focus on today. And then in this, uh, in this case, you know, the, what we want to know is that the, whether the, what, how the model solve corresponds to how we want the model to solve. Let's see what, what I mean by that. So if you think about it, unfortunately, using these models, in particular the models that operate on this kind of combinatorial output space, such as a large-scale language models, is extremely, extremely hard because the space of potential answers is extremely large. It's exponential, literally so. And then that is, we cannot really solve the problem of finding the one best or top K best, K best answers from this exponentially large space exactly. It's just not possible. So instead, what we can do is to either solve it approximately by using some kind of approximate search algorithm, or we can, in fact, introduce some additional auxiliary variables, which I use Z to denote, in order to decompose the problem into two stages. The first stage is to, is to figure out this course, uh, the reasoning or the solution in a smaller or the narrow down search space. And then given the search space in the second stage, we are going to find the answer. Now, this all sounds way too abstract, it doesn't really probably hit exact uh, what you have been thinking about a lot during the past, you know, at the 11 month or so, actually almost exactly a year since the ChatGPT was introduced by OpenAI. In fact, earlier today, there was an OpenAI at the first uh, developer conference, right? So let's go into this kind of large scale language models and then try to see what this, you know, the process of inference or the searching for a solution corresponds to. You probably have already heard of you know, what they refer to as a chain of thought generation or the scratch pad or whatnot. That is, instead of asking language models to give you the answer directly, given the question, what we're going to ask the language model to think step by step and then trying to process or the, trying to reason step by step until it arrives at the answer. And then what this actually does is that these steps of the reasoning corresponds to figuring out what the answer is going to be approximately in the original answer space in another space that corresponds to this reasoning space, which is often a lower dimensional. Now, in this kind of language model sense, you know, it's a bit difficult to measure the dimensionality, but what is assumed here is that the it's kind of, let's say, chain of reasoning or these reasoning steps, intermediate reasoning steps, are simpler, are simpler to take than finding the answer directly. And then once we have these steps of the reasoning, we should be able to readily go to the correct answer without any trouble of going th searching through this combinatorial or the exponentially large sort of space. But then, of course, the question is, now, is this chain of thought reasoning really how reasoning happens? Perhaps, yes. I went into the OpenAI uh, playground about a week or so ago, so it might be already outdated based on what I saw today at the OpenAI's uh, developers conference. But if you look at it, it looks like it really does. So I asked the uh, OpenAI's text DaVinci 03 for some of the questions on counting the number of the echoes that are left in the James bag. And then sometimes it's going to give you the correct steps of the reasoning that lead to the correct answer, or sometimes it's going to make a mistake and then have an incorrect reasoning that leads to the incorrect answer. So that is that it's an incorrect answer, but has a consistent reasoning. Based on this, it looks like, yes, indeed, this Z corresponds to how reasoning happens. But then you have the, however, if you just try it just a couple more times using the OpenAI's text DaVinci 03, what you notice is that the, what, we, what we say as a chain of thoughts does not really look like the chain of thoughts or the how reasoning happens, at least according to what we think reasoning is. Sometimes we see that the answer is correct, but the steps of reasoning is simply incorrect. Sometimes the answer is incorrect, and reasoning is also incorrect. Sometimes the answer is incorrect, but the reasoning was correct, but this reasoning was ignored. So somehow it looks like 
there is something that is going on that is very different from what we are told these language models are doing. In fact, Yasha already told us earlier today what is going on largely. But I'm going, uh, you know, these are some of the examples that you can actually find yourselves very easily by simply going into the open AI playground and then play around with it yourself for about five to 10 minutes. And then indeed, you know, I'm not the only one, nor you know, many of you who probably have tried are not the only ones who have been thinking about this. There are a number of papers that were uh, published or they put online publicly this year and past years that actually wanted to ask this question. Is this chain of thought or the so-called reasoning process, in fact, representative of the actual reasoning? So Lanham et al. 2013, but 2023, from the anthropic, tried to ask whether this chain of thought is indeed a chain of thought or just some artifact of training these language models by altering this reasoning chain little by little and then see if the out, uh, answer changes. The Parofel 2023 from NYU, in fact, went further and then checked whether this chain of thoughts is correct. How did they do it? They actually did it by asking the language model to prove or provide a proof to a statement and then use the proof as the thing that we can actually check the correctness of. And then the answer to both of them is that the, indeed these large-scale language models seem to do some kind of reasoning, but they often fail in a way that are completely different from how we anticipate these language models to fail. And also the failure seems to be extremely different from the typical failures that we see from the humans. So it doesn't look like that reasoning patterns revealed by this Z, uh, you know, tells us that the LMs do reason like we do. Sometimes reasoning steps are ignored. Sometimes reasoning steps are incorrect. And then now, of course, as a scientist, the natural question is, what causes such unfaithful patterns of reasoning? And then to answer this question, beyond just providing anecdotal examples, we have to think about the, what are the minimal set of tests that we can come up with that allow us to check how often, what, uh, allow us to conclude what kind of patterns or the un, what kind of like, the unfaithfulness patterns we observe in these language models. So that is, in order to perform more careful inspection, we have to define and test a set of minimal unit consistencies. So before I you know, start defining some of those consistencies, some assumptions here that I want to point out, and it's going to be an important one in particular near the end, is that the first we use a greedy decoding. That is that the temperature is going to be set to zero or one. So it just finds the most likely token at each of the time steps. And then I'm going to rely a bit on a two very vague, but somewhat workable definitions. First one is the semantic equivalence. That is, if two text, two text snippets given a context are semantically equivalent, then I'm going to use this uh, tilde symbol there. And the replacement uh, says that the, well, you know, the, I know how to replace some of the markers, some of the placeholders with a new text while changing all these templates so that the, it's just a naive replacement that preserves the sy uh, syntax as well as the semantics. And then these are vague because natural languages tend to be very, very vague themselves. But then yeah, we're going to rely on this by relying on our common sense here. So what are some of these minimal consistencies? Of course, you know, again, you know, I'm not the first one to think about it. A lot of people have thought about it. In fact, a lot of people have started to thought about it in the context of the language model already in 2020. That was after the birth and other large... You know, back then, large-scale language models, in particular, the mask language models, started to show up. For instance, Elarza et al. in 2021 uh, proposed the idea that the, these language models should be self-consistent. That is, if the ans uh, questions were semantically equivalent, the answers have to be semantically equivalent as well. And then, of course, they show that the, it was not the case for BERT. The BERT nor the Roberta exhibited a high degree of the self-consistency. Now, interesting thing, I went into the OpenAI's uh, playground myself again a week, a week or so ago, and then I tested it out. Does 
GPT 3.5 Turbo Instruct 0915 exhibits self consistency. Within two to three uh, trials, I noticed that the unfortunately uh, these models are not really self consistent. And more recently, Berlin Dell 2023 showed that the these models, in particular OpenAI models, often do not exhibit the equivalence consistency. The, what is the equivalence consistency? They called it a, a reversal curse, which I think is a pretty horrible name to give because the, in natural language, E's does not necessarily mean that the A is B, A and B are equivalent to each other. So in this case, if we know that the P and Q, two statements are equivalent, then what we should know is that the one of the one uh, when when we are asked to say what is the uh, what is the equivalent of the original one, then the language model should be able to tell us that the, the other one is the one that is equivalent, and then vice versa. Otherwise, the language model really does not know that the A and B uh, are equivalent to each other. So all these things are there. So then you, have to, you, sure, you start seeing the pattern. Okay, so there are these, let's say, minimal set of the consistencies that we, we need our language models to uh, exhibit or possess in order for us to be able to confidently say that these language models reason as we expect them to do and as we reason as well. So in this paper, we actually propose a two different, another uh, minimal types of the consistency. The first one is a hypothetical consistency. That is that the does, if the language model knows its own answer to a question, then when we ask the language model what the, what the answer to this question is going to be, the language model should be able to answer in the same way. That is, the language model should be able to make a hypothetical situation in which the language model is asked about its own answer, and then this language model should know about its own answer if we believe that this language model can reason about itself. So it's a bit you know, the uh, weird thing, but you know, let's look at an example. So for instance, uh, let's say the original question was, how old was the president of Korea in 2018? The answer was 25 years old, and then that's the answer from the text of Vinci 03, and then that's the correct answer. If I ask the text of Vinci 03, what is your answer to the question, how old was the president of Korea in 2018? It should be able to give me the same answer as the original question. And then in this case, text of Vinci 03 was correct. So it was very consistent in the sense of the hypothetical consistency. However, unfortunately, text of Vinci 03 is not highly consistent in this hypothetical consistency. Uh, let's look at an example on the bottom. So I asked the question, how old was the president of Korea in 2012? The chat text of Vinci 03 answered that the, she was 58 years old, old. And then I asked text of Vinci 03 again, what is your answer to the question, how old was the president of Korea in 2012? And then suddenly, text of Vinci 03 decided, to, decided that this answer was going to be 60 years old. So there is a clear inconsistency there. And then in other words, this model really does not know about itself because it cannot really simulate its own, let's say, ways in which the questions are answered. But then you have, unfortunately, checking the hypothetical consistency in a qualitative and systematic way is not trivial at all. So we had to come up with a new protocol that allows us to check the hypothetical consistency. The first, first step is to prepare a set of some templates or the identity templates. And then second, we're going to use multiple models of the different qualities or the different, let's say, aspects to produce multiple possible answers from, uh, to the same original question. So in this particular example, the original question is, this quilt begun in 1856 when she was 17 includes the autographs on top of the blocks of many known celebrities and politicians of the day, other. And then we ask uh, language models, these different language models, to complete it for the up to three words. And then we use the, all those different models from the OpenAI uh, open API. And then now we create this multiple choice question. Now, why are we doing this? Because this kind of multiple choice question allows us to 
be more systematic and also much more automated about the checking whether the answers are correct or not. And then what we do is that the, if in each of the models, sorry about that, each of the model can identify its own answer among all those different answers that have been produced by different models. So any model that exhibits the hypothetical consistency or a high degree of hypothetical consistency should be able to, with a high chance, identify out of all these five answers, which one was produced by its own when asked with the original question. And the answer is, unfortunately, that the most of this model, except for text Da Vinci 03, which is indeed the largest models out of these five, uh, four different models that we compared against, uh, figure out the, uh, its own answers more than, let's say, 20% of time. And 20% is the random chance because there were five potential answer choices. And even text of Inch 03 could barely pick up its own answer, only about 30% accuracy out of five choices. And then we could we tried it with the GPT-4 instead of the te text of Inch 03, and then we get the similar kind of, let's say, level of the accuracy. And then this really tells us that the, these language models do not model their own reasoning process and cannot simulate themselves internally, which is very different from us. Almost always, the humans, we know how we would answer any questions and then be able to say that the best how, the, how we would actually answer these questions. Unfortunately, these language models do not seem to be able to do so. Now, why did we not actually mix in the GPT-4 and the text DaVinci-03 together is because GPT-4 and the text DaVinci-03 tends to answer this, most of these questions in a similar way so that this kind of multiple choice uh, protocol doesn't work. What that means is that the, this protocol so far is useful because these models are not hypothetically consistent. But as these models get better and better and converge towards the same set of models or the same solution, this kind of protocol is not going to allow us to check the hypothetical consistency, meaning that we will have to come up with a new protocol that allows us to check the hypothetical consistency in the future. So that's a one consistency. And we were already quite surprised that these models were not able to achieve a high level, high degree of the hypothetical consistency. So we thought, okay, let's try something even simpler. And then that's how we came up with this compositional consistency. And compositional consistency is really simple in the sense that if I have a compositional statement and I'm going to take some subclause from this compositional statement and then replace the subclause with the answer to the subclause based on its own language model, a language model's answer, then the language model's answer shouldn't really change at all. That is, if I ask the language model, what is 12 plus 3.5? and then ask the language model what is 12, point, uh, 12 plus 8, the answer should be the same if the language model knew that the 3 plus 5 was 8. Now, there are two different ways in which the language model can be inconsistent compositionally. One is that the, maybe you know, it's going to get the top-closed answer correctly, but the overall answer is incorrect when you replace it, or vice versa. That is that the, the answer is incorrect, but so the subclose answer is incorrect, but the overall answer is correct. In both cases, we're not going to say that the, these, these models actually do know anything about the compositional structure of this extremely simple, let's say, cases of the compositional consistency. So of course, there are some under, in undetermined cases, but I'm going to skip that one. So let's look at some of the examples. I just also wanted to try it out myself using the OpenAI Playground. Again, a week, and a week or so ago using the text of Inch 03. So let's look at the left panel. Four factorial. And then I asked the language model, you know, what the four factorial is. And they gave me a 24 correct answer. And they gave me the reasoning that is also correct. And then in the center panel, I asked the text of Inch 03, what, is, what four plus four factorial is. And then it actually gave me the correct answer that is 28. Now on the right panel, I literally replaced the four factorial from the mid panel with the answer, text of inch 03's own answer from the left panel, that is 24, by asking the text of inch 03 what, the, what 4 plus 24 is. And then somehow text of inch 03 answered saying that it is 48. And in this case, we would call it, call it say that, okay, 
text DaVinci Resolve 3 is compositionally inconsistent. And then how do we actually check the compositional consistency? This one is much more systematic and easy to automate. So we tried it with uh, two different uh, tests, but one of them, uh, one of them, I'm going to just introduce one of them, that is arithmetics. First, we're going to randomly produce a set of nested arithmetic expressions. It's extremely simple. Maximum depth of five, and then we only allow four operators, and then numbers can be only up to three digits. And then in the second step, we're going to extract all non root sub expressions and query the language models for the answers. In this example of the two times three plus six divided by two, we're going to take out two times three and ask the language for, model for the answer, and then six divided by two to get the answer from the language model. Oh, this, you know, the uh, AI is going a bit crazy because the Zoom has this weird, let's say, thing, right? So then you have the, what we can now do is that we can create all these compositionally consistent, let's say, prompts so that we can check whether the answers to this P3, the entire thing, and then these compositionally consistent prompts lead to the same answer by the same language model. And then what we can do is we can just check the rate at which these answers are correct. Any compositionally consistent model should easily achieve the 100%. Yes, I'm almost uh, out of time. So this is almost done. And then what you, the answer is that, the, in fact, unfortunately, none of these models actually do well. The largest model, that is the GPT-4, achieves less than 50% uh, of the compositional consistency. And then smaller models, in fact, uh, go below 20% of the uh, 20% of the accuracy in terms of the composition consistency. And then most of the time are the, uh, most of the cases of the inconsistent cases corresponds to the case where the, the models are somehow able to replace the stop close well, but then even after replacing the stop close, it doesn't really result in a different or the incorrect left answers. And then this really tells us that the language models cannot tell two equivalent expressions which, uh, and then this implies that the lack of understanding of the hierarchical nature or the compositional nature of math expressions. So then you know, the, uh, to wrap up, it looks like what we have seen reveals that they are not really consistent, neither in hypothetical sense or the compositional sense. And then these current generation of LMs do not satisfy two minimal aspects of the consistency. And then what we really see is that the, these language models are often right for the incorrect or the undesirable reasons. And this one was demonstrated really well uh, recently by the OL 2023, where they show that the GPT-4's performance on, along all these amazing, uh, let's say, as, uh, tasks drops significantly as soon as they demonstrate the qu same questions in a way that are not common on the intranet. So if you ask for the arithmetic, let's say, um, you know, the evaluation, it's going to work amazingly well if they are asked in a base 10. But if they are asked in a base 9, then suddenly the accuracy drops dramatically. And then this really tells us that the LLMs are very, very accurate, but they are accurate for the reasons that are not desirable, nor sometimes for the wrong reasons, just like what Yashua actually pointed out earlier today. And I know that the, I uh, went over time, sorry about that. Uh, just so one last, last thing before I wrap it up is that the, whatever I said today, and the, whatever anyone is going to tell you about the language model in terms of the research, has to be taken with the big caveat is that the, a lot of the papers that rely on the open AIs models cannot be reproduced, nor can be actually trusted, nor be uh, follow their conclusions because open AI really never tells us much about the training, models, and deployment. And even if the models are same, even if their model versions are same, how they deploy may change. So we can't really trust you know, what we are, uh, what kind of the conclusions that we're drawing from using open AI APIs. But anyway, so uh, that's the Sorry, I took way too much time. Uh, and then you know, the, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joe, uh, for that interesting presentation. Thank you once again. And next, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Duane Borning, MIT. And he will be talking about machine intelligence for semiconductor manufacturing challenges, progress, and opportunities. So let's welcome him with a warm round of applause. Okay, everybody take a deep breath and to make sure that you hear me. 
Everybody raise your hands and for five seconds shake them. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand. Great. Okay. We're ready for something different. What I want to talk about, and Samsung AI Forum is the best place I can imagine for this, is applications of AI machine learning to semiconductor manufacturing. So leading in AI research, but also a leading manufacturer. So what's happening in manufacturing is what's happening in a lot of areas and disciplines. AI is transforming or revolutionizing those areas. In manufacturing, about every 10 or 15 years, there is a major transformation in the methodologies used. We went from, in the 1980s, uh, lean manufacturing approaches. In the 2000s, global supply chains. About 10, 12 years ago, everybody got very excited about digitization, collecting lots of data. It didn't work out as everybody hoped. Lots of data, but there wasn't the tools to actually use that data effectively. So what's happening now is the applications of AI and machine learning to create machine intelligence to actually be able to get those benefits. And these shifts are the same ones in part that are driving changes in every area, that is large amounts of data are available, and there's dramatic growth in AI methods. Uh, but in the manufacturing case, we've also got huge numbers of sensors on the existing equipment, in factories, and so on. So semiconductor manufacturing is really exciting as an area for AI research, I believe, in part because we got so much varied data. It's not all images. It's not all text. In fact, there's a lot of information about parts, about spatial uh, aspects, as well as temporal aspects, right? Sensors that are measuring process uh, progression inside of fabrication tools. We have chips within wafers. We've got spatial replication, spatial hierarchy. The second thing I want to highlight is we've got a huge taxonomy, a huge library of available machine learning methods. It's not all deep learning. Deep learning is on this little taxonomy down there in the lower right, and that includes attention transformer large language models. But one of the exciting challenges is to take advantage of uh, the large other varieties of machine learning and use those to advantage. So I want to highlight that in actual application in manufacturing industries, including semiconductor, there's both old and new methods. There's deep neural networks, CNNs, uh, recurrent or time series uh, kinds of models, as well as transformer and attention models. But some of the older methods also are still highly valuable, whether it's clustering, just to understand the structure of your data, tree-based models, random forest, etc., or Bayesian and Gaussian process kinds of models that we, in fact, heard a little bit about uh, earlier today. So we've got this big library, you would hope you would find the perfect method for your particular manufacturing problem and be able to pull that off the shelf and apply it. But it turns out that there's a number of really interesting challenges in manufacturing that inhibit the use of most of the standard off-the-shelf methods, or at least require some thinking about how to adapt them. One is that we actually have even in semiconductor manufacturing, where we're fabricating millions, billions of chips, each with billions, hundreds of billions of devices on them, you would think we had large data. It's actually a small data problem, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. Second problem is factories aren't that stable. You build a model, you start to use it, but the fab has changed. The model drifts, or the concept that you've captured in your model drifts. 
A couple of other challenges that are fairly interesting in manufacturing is we have very complex multivariate time dynamics. We're driven processes, right? We're trying to control by driving and actuating things inside of our, our, our equipment or making other decisions in our, in our fab so that the time dynamics are, in fact, a big challenge. And we also don't want to throw away all of our knowledge. We don't want to start with just black box models. We'd like to incorporate some of the underlying physics or domain knowledge that we already have and augment that and go beyond that with our machine learning methods. And then for deployment, we also have explainability or interpretability or trust. Am I actually going to follow the recommendations that are being made? I'd like to at least have some intuition about how those decisions have been arrived at. So I want to mention a few examples. Uh, I'm not, this is a, a number of the uh, kinds of applications we've been working on uh, in my research group at MIT, uh, as well as some of the machine learning methods that we've been developing or adapting uh, to this particular problem. A variety of problems on the application side. I'm just going to mention two shortly here as examples. One is looking at uh, anomaly detection in unit process time series. And the other is a process optimization and control problem. Okay, so let's look at the first one of these. This is one that addresses or is challenged by two of those challenges that I mentioned. So the anomaly detection problem is looking for anomalies, but I have a very small number of the anomalies to train on. So it's a small data problem. And second, I actually need to be able to identify anomalies in the face of drift. So what do I mean by anomaly detection? Imagine I'm measuring some sensor for multiple runs or throughout a run of a particular uh, fabrication process step. What I'd like to do is detect problems in that tool or in that process as soon as possible so that I don't have wasted product. What we'd like to do is classify a sensor signal as either normal or anomalous. But in many cases, you've only got historical known good data. You don't have the classical supervised learning problem where I want to have a classification of good or bad because I don't have training labels for bad or failed sensor signals. Right? The second problem, the concept drift problem, is that usually the fab equipment can drift normally or naturally within some limits, and I'd still want to detect sort of that little blue point anomaly in the face of that drift, okay? So we need to account for or deal with drift. So I'm gonna talk about a really simple method, and then I'll compare it to some of the more sophisticated and even deep learning methods what we originally, when we started looking at this, we wanted to find you know, a really complex uh, deep learning solution that would beat everything else out. And it turned out a simpler approach, this one class classification with known good data uh, uh, problem actually was able to use one of the older uh, 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 methods. So what we're gonna do when I only have known good data is sort of draw a boundary, if you will, in the space of my sensor or sensors of where good operation, known good operation of the equipment is, right? So I characterize each of those points and I have some sort of a boundary around that. Uh, we might do that multivariately or we might simplify and do that uh, multi-univariately. But the inference now is pretty simple is I've got a new sensor point or a new uh, collection of sensor points. Is it similar to the space of known good data or not? So the approach that we've used here is kernel density estimation, sort of a classic machine learning kind of approach, uh, kernel method, where we take the known good examples that we've got, sort of stamp a kernel on that, maybe it's a Gaussian uh, kernel, and out of that I build up an empirical distribution of where known good operation should be. Right? And once I've got that, now I've got a 
an empirical probability density function of where known good operation is. We happen to use Gaussian kernels here. There is still a learning step. I need to figure out the appropriate width of that kernel based on the historical data so that I sort of map out and smooth out the space appropriately. So here's an example to a particular time signal. This is an ion implantation uh, signal in time that's showing the intensity of the ion beam uh, as it scans across a, a particular uh, 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 wafer. In this uh, particular case, this is uh, ion implantation uh, of data from analog devices, uh, a collaborator with us. And here you can see in the left a bunch of blue dots that show kind of the scatter of regular operation, and on the right is just an interpolation using the KDE of the probability density of where known good space of uh, good data should be. Right, so now I've got that probability. If I get a new center point, I can talk about how far away that is from known good operation and build an anomaly score from that. Okay, so this is an ensemble method with known good data. Uh, there is a little bit of, again, training that needs to be done uh, based on an acceptable false alarm rate, uh, et cetera. But the bigger challenge when we actually tried to use this was this concept drift problem. Uh, this is about 11,000 sequential runs of this particular ion implant uh, recipe. And what you might not see is about the first 100 there of known good runs uh, those were all had very small anomaly scores. But then the equipment had slowly drifted, and all of those blue lines you see are large anomaly scores that correspond to still known good data. It wasn't tracking the slow drift, the wear in the equipment. So instead, we needed an approach to track the drift. And this kernel density estimation gives you a really nice, easy way to do that. What you do is, every time you get a new data point, you add it to your ensemble, and you sort of time out the oldest data points. So slowly, you can sort of online learn and adapt where the existing current known good area of your operation is. And if you do that, the red scatter at the top are now the uh, anomaly scores. So you have very, very few anomalies, somewhere around uh, 10,000. There actually is an anomaly, that big red spike. But for the most part, you're no longer having most of your signals being a false alarm. Okay, so we then compared this to sort of the classic statistical process control. We compared this to other one-class uh, support vector machine, uh, one-class uh, uh, version of uh, uh, classification. Uh, we build a uh, variational autoencoder, sort of a version of a deep learning uh, kind of model that would predict what the next point was, and uh, depending on how far away I was from that, we would uh, declare that to be an anomaly. And we applied that both to the ion implant and to plasma etch data. Uh, this particular data uh, came from a painful previous experience with our collaborator where they had an equipment failure that they didn't detect using their existing methods. And so they had actual good runs, uh, something like about 2,000, 2,800 good runs, but they had almost 1,000 wafers that went to waste because they didn't detect the failure on the equipment. It was only a couple of weeks later at an e-test that they were able to detect it. Painful for them, wonderful for us. Wonderful test data set for developing and checking out these, these models. Um, there's a bunch of different sensors on this equipment, uh, about 30 different sensors. A uh, couple of those are illustrated here, including some of the bad runs down on, on the left. One of them is uh, the temperature of an electrode. Uh, the other is an optical endpoint, uh, uh, an OES endpoint detector. So here's one of the known good run uh, KDEs that is built up. This again, there's variation, natural variation in where those good sensor data points should be, 
we train the detector with about 250 of those known good runs, and then test it on that golden data set that we had with both good and anomalous runs. And these are just the uh, uh, receiver operator uh, characteristic curves, ROC curves, uh, trading off the false positive versus true positive rates. Uh, lines might be a little bit thin. If I were to bold it, the KDE actually has a perfect ROC curve in this particular case, an area under curve of one. You can see some of these other lines here are the competing approaches. Um, some of them are, in fact, really bad. A classic statistical process control approach has an AUC less than 0 0.5, meaning it was worse than random guessing. It was wrong more often than it was right. And the basic intuition here is we're able to build an empirical distribution with this kernel density estimator of really for any time slice where normal signals should be, whereas classic SPC assumes a Gaussian distribution, right? So it's very wrong on its probability density estimate. So overall, compared to uh, the sort of classic uh, or deep learning approaches, for example, the VAE, we found that the simple KDE performed really quite well on both the ion implant and the uh, 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 plasma etch uh, cases, although the VAE came in sort of second. So that's one example where a relatively simple approach worked quite well. I want to give you a different example, the second example, which really targets a couple of the other challenges that I mentioned. One is incorporating domain knowledge, some knowledge of the physics, as well as giving some engineering intuition about the recommendations being made by the model. And this is also an ion implant. This collaboration, in fact, was uh, on state-of-the-art commercial equipment with applied materials. The basic problem is spatial non-uniformity in the ion implant beam intensity as it's scanned from the left side to the right side of a wafer. And that blue line there is showing the non-uniformity in that particular scan, sort of a default um, uh, scan. So what we would like to do is adjust the dwell time of that beam as it scans across there. So I should dwell a little bit further or longer when I have a low beam intensity in order to get more uniform uh, implant. What's the reason for this non-uniformity? It turns out that the beam has a width to it. It's 100 micron or 100 millimeter kind of width, but that beam shape changes because of inherent limitations in the equipment. Uh, uh, and that beam shape changes as you scan from left to right. And so you can sort of see at left, the beam intensity is higher, and as I scan to the right, it both broadens in and the intensity decreases. So what we'd like to do is build a machine learning model of the shape of the beam as a function of the position where it's being scanned. And then once I have that, I can optimize, find the best dwell times in order to compensate and get a uniform approach. So the method that we used here is Bayesian uh, optimization. Our surrogate model, the model that we're going to build, is an empirical model of the beam intensity at each of these spatial locations. But what we did is indeed use Bayesian approaches so that we had some knowledge of what we think the beam shape is, but we also modeled the uncertainty. And what this let us do is know where we had pretty good estimates of the, where the model is accurate, but also where we don't know. So when I want to run the next tuning experiment, I might optimize based on what I already know, or I might, using the lack of confidence that I've got in other areas, it might be better to explore over in that space in order to improve the model. So the basic Bayesian optimization loop, this is the classic Bayesian optimization loop, is that one has that confidence, a, a model both of your best guess, but also the distribution of 
model parameters, and you have an acquisition function that would suggest where you're going to either gain the most uh, information or gain the most improvement in your process, and that tells you where to do your next experiment, where that acquisition function is optimal or highest. And based on that, you get more information, now you have a little bit better model of what the uh, overall performance is, and you repeat this until you uh, converge to a good enough uh, answer. Right? So you can drive yourself both with exploring the space, but also driving to some uh, local or global optima. Okay, here's the application though. This is where more of the engineering knowledge comes in. These Bayesian approaches are really wonderful in that you can imprint your prior understanding or your prior knowledge, okay? So here we have some physics. Uh, the, the overall beam dose is just the product of the beam intensity, B, times the dwell time. But then I have a spread in my knowledge of the beam intensity, that beam width uh, as a function of, of, of space. So what's plotted here is really the piece that we don't know. It's this B matrix, the, the beam intensity, as a function of where the beam is located on the wafer, what the intensity of the ion implant is uh, uh, across the wafer from that beam center location. So you can see as we go from left to right, the beam intensity is following the center of the beam, but the spread and the shape is changing a little bit. Now, whenever I get a new measurement of the actual beam intensity, I can do my Bayesian update and get a better model, a better estimate of that B shape. Okay, so the prior belief turns out to be very, very valuable here. We make a very simple assumption that it's just a perfectly Gaussian beam shape. It's really not, but it's a good starting point, okay? And we also make the assumption it doesn't have any spatial dependence. Based on that, we can also model more than just our best guess. We can also model how knowledge of the beam intensity at one location tells me something about the beam intensity nearby. So we actually capture the covariance information as well. This means every time I get a new measurement, I would not only update my best guess of what the beam intensity was, but I can propagate that very, very quickly to what I think the beam intensity is elsewhere, nearby, on the wafer. So we can formulate this prior and then use that in the Bayesian update, the Bayesian optimization loop. So we start with this sort of simple Gaussian prior. I do one run and get a linear profile with, say, constant dwell times. I use that, and that tells me a lot about the beam intensity shapes that function across the wafer. And if you look really carefully, you might be able to see that the left edge intensity uh, increases and the right edge intensity decreases based on that one loop. And based on that, with just a very small number of iterations, we can drive from a very non-uniform implant to a very uniform uh, implant. And you can see uh, down at the bottom is just the dwell time optimization. And it starts to be very sort of explainable. You can look at it and say, ah, I have to have a lot more dwell time on the right because my beam intensity is too low on the right. That's what I'm using to compensate once I have the actual beam intensities. Uh, this was very valuable. It drove uh, the number of tuning runs, which would typically range from three to six uh, in this particular tool set for a new recipe down to under three most of the time and saved also on overall implant time. So those are the two examples I wanted to share with you. I should say there's a number of other exciting challenges and opportunities remaining. Uh, there's great interest in meta-learning in neural networks to deal with the concept drift, so you learn what the drift itself is. Uh, the complex time dynamics, I showed some uh, anomaly detection. There are opportunities for transformer attention networks uh, uh, as well. And in fact, one quick example. Uh, here is a paper that we're presenting at NeurIPS uh, in, in December that uses a version of a transformer network in order to 
detect both point anomalies, but also contextual or, or drift uh, kinds of anomalies. So I think I just want to wrap up by saying uh, semiconductor manufacturing is a great place to explore the application of a lot of different machine learning approaches because, again, we've got challenging problems, but we've also got a lot of highly interesting and non-standard data. And to learn more, uh, please go to our website. You can see more about our examples. And with that, I'm happy to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations. So now you may return to your seats. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the last part of the session one, we have Kimin Lee from KAIST, and his presentation will be about reinforcement learning from human feedback for fine-tuning text-to-image models. So, Kimin Lee, the floor is now yours. Please welcome him. Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Lee. I'm an assistant professor at KAIS. I came Samsung AI from as a student five years ago, and now I'm having a presentation. So it's my big honor, and thank you for having me today. In this, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about my recent work on aligning text-to-image model using human feedback. So what is text-to-image model? Basically, it is an AI system creating realistic images from the text description. So here is some interesting uh, example from the DALI2 text-to-image model from the OpenAI. And as you can see, when I provide an astronaut riding a horse as an input prompt, this model successfully generates the uh, uh, corresponding image as an output. This is quite intriguing because you can imagine that in the training data, Maybe there is no image about astronaut riding a horse. But surprisingly, this model understands the concept of the astronaut riding and a horse, and then generate the realistic image by combining this concept at the test time. So what, what are the you know, important components behind this success? The first component is algorithmic advance in the deep generative models, like diffusion model and you know, uh, generative artificial network especially the progress on the diffusion model has been very crucial in the recent success. The second important component is large-scale multimodal data set. Uh, many researchers have been working on collecting the billions of the image text pair from the internet, and by training deep generative model on such large-scale data set, many companies release the state-of-the-art text-to-image model like DALI, Imagine, and Stable Diffusion. And in recent two years, the, uh, these uh, large-scale text-to-image model have achieved a remarkable success in the text-to-image text generation. So let's look at some examples from the DALI-3, most recent text-to-image model from the OpenAI. As you can see, it can generate the very creative image like human hearts with a tiny universe inside. Or by just specifying what you want as a text prompt, it can also generate the fancy poster going to the Venus or sketchy style illustration of the hedgehog. And this model also can be extended to the other application. So for example, in instruct pix to pix uh, text-to-image model has been uh, utilized as a text-based image editor. So if I provide the original image of the sunflower by Van Gogh and some instruction for the editing, this model generates the edited version, which replaces the sunflower with the rose by following the instruction. And you can also generate the video from this model. So this is some interesting example from the Zemo AI when I provide the reference image of my dog and instruction like a small brown dog sitting on the floor. Then it generates a very nice video of the uh, cute brown dog as shown in this example. So these kinds of the examples clearly show the promise of the text-to-image model. But at the same time, there are many risks of the text-to-image model. And actually, in this presentation, I want to talk more about the risk rather than promise. Then what are the potential risks? 
The first one is the generating of fake information. So here is some example in March 2023. And there was a rumor that uh, Trump was arrested by the police, and many people start to generate these kinds of fake information, fake images using the AI model, and upload them to the, their social media like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so in other words, people already start to misuse this uh, AI model as a source of the fake information. And now we can't tell this is the fake image, but as the model becomes better and better, uh, in the future, it is hard to dis distinguish the fake information and the uh, real, Im real information. There is also a risk about the encoding the undesired bias in the training data, which are usually collected from the internet. Let's look at some interesting uh, analysis from the Bloomberg. So in order to check whether there is a bias in the stable diffusion, open source the text-to-image text -to model, they generate the image about the job title and then measure the gender and the skin tones. So in detail, given some text prompts about the, some job title like job, uh, CEO, they first generate the 300 image from the uh, stable diffusion VUM5. And based on the skin tone classifier, uh, they classify the each face into the one of the six class uh, where the type 1 to type 3 correspond to the lighter skin, and type 4 to type 6 correspond to the darker skin. And they also measure the gender based on the reviews from the reporter. So let's look at the generated image and the statistics about the CEO. Based on the result, the conclusion is followed. The 90% the of the image is classified as a, a lighter skin tone, and uh, they are labeled as a man. So this implies that stable diffusion generates a man with a lighter skin as a representative of the CEO. Let's look at the, another example about the social worker. Based on the result, stable diffusion generates a woman with a darker skin tone as a representative of the social worker. So in this way, they evaluate on the uh, seven high-paying jobs in the U.S. and the seven low-paying uh, low jobs in the U.S. And here is the conclusion. The word according to the stable diffusion is run by white male CEO, and women are rarely doctor, lawyer, or judge, and men with a darker skin usually commit a crime, while the women with a darker skin flip the burgers. This is so biased behavior. And problem is that such bias can perpetuate the stereotype which could result in the unfair treatment. So here is my research question. How to align this generative model with the human intentions for mitigating the risk and the developing safe AI system? And definitely there are many possible solutions, but with a collaborator from the uh, Google Research, UC Berkeley, and the uh, University of Wisconsin, I've been investigating the human in the loop learning method. Uh, basically, the core idea is the getting the human feedback on the model's output, and then fine-tuning the model based on the human feedback. And in this way, we want to align our text to image model with the human intention. So here is a very simple illustration for our overview of the our method. First, we start with a pre-trained model, denoted as a version zero and generate several output from the, some given text prompts like green dog in this case. Next, human annotator provides some feedback like uh, good or bad in this case, and based on this human feedback, we fine-tune the model. Then after fine-tuning, uh, this uh, updated model generates a better image, which are more aligned with the text prompts, and we are also getting the uh, human feedback and then fine-tuning the model again. So by repeating, the getting the uh, by repeating the process of the getting feedback and updating the model, basically we align the model with the human intention. So that's the high-level overview of the human in terms of learning or learning from human feedback framework. And let me explain more detail from the next slide, step by step. So first step is collecting the human data. And for this part, definitely main question is what kinds of the human feedback we, we need to utilize. Uh, in our recent work, we just utilized the simple binary feedback like good or bad, uh, just for the simplicity. But it is also possible to use the other feedback like 
you know, a pairwise comparison by showing the two different outputs from the same text prompts. And then you can collect the preference over the two outputs. So here I want to emphasize that each feedback has a different pros and cons. And depending on your problem and the uh, domain or use cases, uh, uh, the best human feedback can be different. So you need to be careful about the how to choose the human feedback according to your problem. But anyway, uh, once we collect the uh, human feedback, the next step is the learning or reward function. So as shown in this diagram, reward model is the uh, function of the input text from X and image Y, generating a scalar value as an output. And we want to train this model to predict the human feedback. So specifically, in the case of the binary feedback, we can simply minimize the mean square error loss between the output of the reward model and the human feedback by assigning one for good and zero for bad example. And in case of the preference feedback, we can minimize the cross entropy loss between the reward and the, uh, our human annotation. So here, the YW denotes the prepared image, and YL denotes the rejected image. So basically what this loss function is doing is making the, uh, our reward model to generate the high score on the prepared image. So, <clears throat> so in this way, we can align our uh, uh, reward model to generate the score which is aligned with our uh, human feedback. Right, then let's move on to the final step. The step three is the fine tuning the text to image model by maximizing, by optimizing the following objective function. So here, uh, over some distribution of the text prompts, we first generate the online sample from the, our text to image model, P data. And our goal is maximizing the uh, learned score function, uh, expected uh, reward score over the, our text to, text to image model and the distribution of the text prompts. And in order to achieve this goal, uh, many techniques like reward weighted loss, policy gradient, and reward back propagation have been proposed. But in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the policy gradient method, which is presented in our uh, uh, URIPS paper. So the main idea of the, our paper is interpreting the, the text to image model as a policy and defining the fine tuning task as an RL problem. Uh, I'm going to skip the full mathematical detail, but let me explain the high level idea using this animation. First, uh, we define the, our policy as a pre trained model, and given some text prompts like Green Rabbit, we generate the image from the current model. And as you can see, at the beginning, this pre-trained model generate the uh, not aligned image by generating a, a gray label with a green background. So when you measure the you know, quality of the generated output using our learned reward function, it usually generates the low score. And we provide this signal via policy gradient to the pre-trained model and then updating the, our parameter. And after 1,000 updates, as you can see, it slightly improved the quality of the output. So when you generate the green rabbit from the 1,000, after the 1,000 of this, uh, as shown in this figure, it generates the green, uh, the rabbit with a green pearl uh, as, it, as it is intended. So we, when you measure the reward score, score is slightly improved. And based on this score, we're also doing a policy gradient. Then after 2,000 updates, uh, as we intended, uh, our updated model can successfully generate the uh, green rabbit, uh, as shown in this figure. So <clears throat> basically, the core idea is get, uh, generating the online sample from the updated model and measure the quality based on the, the reward function trained with the human feedback. And by providing the signal, we basically improving the model uh, by iterating this process. <laughs> And in our experiments, uh, we, we show that indeed this RL, uh, online RL fine tuning can improve the quality of the pre trained model. So, first, let's look at the three output, uh, output from the stable diffusion V1.5 on the three, three text prompts uh, testing the compositional generation and creative generation. 
As you can see, the original model doesn't uh, follow the instruction and fail to generate the uh, uh, image aligned with the uh, text prompts. But if we fine tune this model using a uh, uh, using RL algorithm called DPOK, which is uh, which we propose in the paper, uh, basically after the fine tuning, the model follow the instruction and successfully generate the image which are aligned with our text instruction. So for example, in case of the dog on the moon, the original model generates the human instead of the dog. But fine-tuned model can successfully you know, just replace the human with the dog and you know, uh, generate the image aligned with our text prompts. And in case of the red book and the yellow base, in the original model, there was no red book, but uh, our fine-tuned model uh, <coughs> re replaced the base with a uh, uh, red book as intended. And so this implies that uh, this RA fine tuning with a human reward can improve the overall quality of the pre trained model. And we also check whether we can indeed reduce the, some undesired bias in the original model. So let's look at the output from this stable diffusion uh, XL 1.0 on the three different text prompts. So in order to check out the counting ability, I provide the three, four, five rows as a text prompt and generate the image. But somewhat weirdly, I found that only for three and five, it generates the flower rows. But for the four rows, actually it generates the whiskey instead of the flower rows. So it looks very weird to me at the first time. So I searched the four rows on the Google and I found that there is a whiskey brand called the Four Roses. And actually, if you type the Four Roses on the Google, first page is about this whiskey, not a flower rose. And again, usually we train this model on the large scale data set from the internet, and that data set definitely contains these you know, whiskey image for the Four Roses. And model just memorized this you know, training data and showing the, these kinds of the biased behavior. So uh, in order to check whether we can uh, mitigate this undesired bias in the original model, we fine-tune the stable diffusion using a human reward. And <clears throat> as shown in this figure, basically we found that uh, the fine-tuned model generates the flower rows after the fine-tuning. And because, this is because the human reward generate, uh, provide a low score for the you know, whiskey, whiskey image when we provide the four rows as an input. But uh, when, it, uh, when model generate the flower rows as an output, uh, it success, uh, you know, uh, the reward, reward model provide a more high score. So by maximizing the reward model from the human feedback, we found that uh, we can also mitigate the issue with the undesired bias in the original model. Right, so here is the conclusion. So there are so many risks about the, uh, from the text-to-image model, like fake information or undesired bias. Uh, also, I didn't talk about the also other issues, like maybe impacts on the jump market or some issue with the uh, you know, copyrights. But uh, I'd like to say that you know, even though Yoshua talked about, talk, uh, you know, in the, in the early session, the uh, RL with the human feedback is not a good solution for this, you know, uh, mitigating the uh, risk from the text, uh, the generative AI. But I still believe that this is the one good direction to reduce the risk and to obtain the uh, better aligned model from the, uh, by getting the, by interacting with the human feedback. And, Right, so that's, the, that's it for today, and uh, thank you for your attention, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Kim and Lee, for that uh, fantastic uh, presentation. So with that, we'll end this session. Thank you very much. So let me uh, introduce our first speaker of the session too, Yong Sang Choi, a VP of Technology, SAITS, and who will open up the second session with presentation on LM, LLMs for semiconductors. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yong Sang Choi, VP of Technology. Hello, everyone. Uh, for this talk, I will speak in, in Korean. 
because for better communication with our Korean speakers. Uh, for English speakers, please look at the material because it is written in English. 아, 이제 한국어로 말씀을 드릴게요. 어, 좀덜 졸리실 수도 있어요. 아, 좋아하시네. <웃음> 저희 제목은 라지 랭귀지 모델을 세미컨덕터에 어떻게 쓰는지고요. 사실은 제너럴한 세미컨덕터보다는 삼성 세미컨덕터에 어떻게 쓸지가 저의 관심입니다. 솔직히 얘기하면. 예, 컨텐츠는 아주 조, 간단합니다. 왜 우리가 이걸 하는지, 뭘 만들 건지, 누가 만들 건지, 그리고 어떤 일들을 했고 앞으로 무슨 어려움들이 있는지를 말씀드릴게요. 다음, 어, 먼저 우리가 라지 랭귀지 모델 얘기를 할 건데 라지 랭귀지 모델을 반도체에 적용하기 위해서 라지 랭귀지 모델이 지금까지 어떻게 발전되었는지를 간단하게만 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 어, 제가 보기에 LLM은 어, 어떤 특정한 비전을 가지고 쭉 발전해 온 것이 아니고요. 어, 어느 정도 시행착오를 거쳐서 테크놀로지를 익스플로레이션하는 과정에서 만들어졌다라고 생각을 합니다. 어, 라지 랭귀지 모델은 기본적으로 랭귀지 모델이고요. 랭귀지 모델은 단어의 확률을 맞추는 겁니다. 지금 제가 말을 하고 있지만 소리가 잘안 들리실 수도 있는데 잘안 들리는 소리가 있어도 앞에 단어가 뭐 있는지에 따라서 이 말을 맞출 수가 있죠. 우리 머릿속에서 일어나는 거거든요. 그렇게 머릿속에서 일어난 일들을 실제로 기술적으로 쓰는 데는 음성 인식이 가장 먼저 어플리케이션이었습니다. 음성 인식 기술을 만들 때 소리에 대한 인식이 잘안될 경우에 앞에 단어를 가지고 그 단어를 맞출 수 있는 확률을 높여줍니다. 그래서 랭귀지 모델이 아주 중요한 컴포넌트였죠. 그리고 랭귀지 모델은 엔그램이라는 방식을 통해서 여러 가지 NLP 테스트에 오랫동안 쓰여왔습니다. 또한 가지의 추세는 뭐냐면 머신 트랜슬레이션, 즉 기계 번역이 중요한 어플리케이션인데 이 문제를 어떻게 받냐면 한국어 문장이 들어오면 영어 문장으로 바로 바꿔주는 거. 어, 몇 분들은 이제 통역기를 쓰시겠지만 이 통역을 하는 거죠. 그것은 문제를 입력에 대한 한국어 시퀀스를 출력에 대한 영어 시퀀스로 직접적으로 바꿔주는 뉴럴 넷을 사용함으로써 가능했습니다. 근데 이 일들이 어떻게 일어났냐면 시퀀스를 가지고 시퀀스를 맵핑할 때 다음 시퀀스를 하나하나 단어 하나하나마다 생성을 해내죠. 근데 그 단어들이 생성될 때 어떤 앞에 입력을 보고 그 단어를 생성하는지를 찾아내는 메커니즘을 어텐션 메커니즘이라고 정의를 했고 그 어텐션 메커니즘 때문에 번역 기술이 굉장히 많이 발전을 했어요. 근데 여기서 아이디어를 얻은 것이 사실은 트랜스포머 아키텍처가 되겠습니다. 트랜스포머는 입력과 출력 사이에 어텐션만 보는 게 아니라 입력 자신의 입력 모듈에서의 자신 사이에서의 셀프 어텐션과 출력물 자체에서의 자기 자신을 간의 어텐션을 같이 보기 때문에 어텐션을 모두 보는 메커니즘이라고 할수 있죠. 이렇게 만들어진 트랜스포머가 어디에 쓰일지 사람들이 연구를 했을 때 제일 처음 쓰였던 것은 버트라는 모델입니다. 텍스트가 들어왔을 때이 문제를 원래 트레이스널한 랭귀지 모델인 다음 단어를 예측하는 게 아니라 음, 문장 속에 특정 단어들을 몇개 구멍을 내놓고 그 구멍을 맞추는 문제로 바꿔 풀었던 거죠. 이렇게 바꿔, 문제를 바꿔 풀게 되니까 이 모델을 가지고 되게 많은 NLP 문제들이 자동으로 풀렸어요. 그래서 GPT가 나오기 전에는 어, 버트가 굉장히 잘 팔리던 모델이었죠. 그런데 우리가 또 하나 봐야 될 거는 다이얼로그 엔진이라는 게 있습니다. 우리가 컴퓨터랑 대화를 할때뭐 시리라든지 어, 삼성의 빅스비라든지 이런 모델들이 컴퓨터와 대화를 할때그 대화를 어떻게 모델링하느냐가 이제 중요해지는데 이것도 역시 시퀀스로 시퀀스로 모델을 하려는 노력이 있었습니다. 컴퓨터가 이 말을 하면 사람이 이 말을 하고 사람이 이 말을 하면 컴퓨터가 이 말을 하고 그렇게 대화를 자연스럽게 이어지는 모델을 만들었는데요. 굉장히 오랫동안 연구를 했지만 실패했습니다. 그 실패한 이유는 충분한 다이얼로그의 쌍들을 합숙시킬 수 없었기 때문이죠. 그러면 그 다음에 이, 이 인텔리전트 에이전트가 실패했는데 왜 우리가 지금 보고 있는 LLM들은 이런 대화를 가능하게 하느냐 다시 문제를 Next Word Prediction이라는 오리지널 문제로 바꿨기 때문에 가능해졌습니다. 그 이유는 굉장히 많은 텍스트를 가장 쉽게 학습시킬 수 있는 방법이었기 때문이죠. 그래서 Next Word Prediction이라는 랭귀지 모델의 문제를 아주 큰 뉴럴 네트워크 그리고 아주 많은 데이터로 만들었던 것이 이 LLM의 결과물이 된 겁니다. 아, 이런 기술이 이제 나왔어요. 다음 페이지. 그러면 이 LLM이 나왔는데 처음에 사람들은 뭐 그런 게 있는 줄 알았는데 저게 과연 뭐 사람들의 흥미를 끌까 하는 어, 의심이 있었습니다. 근데 제너럴 유저들이 이 LLM을 보고 굉장히 좋아하게 됐어요. 왜냐하면 사람들은 말하는 걸 되게 좋아하거든요. 말하는 것을 좋아하고 말을 듣는 것도 좋아합니다. 그래서 뭐라고 막 말을 했더니 거기에 대해서 대답을 막 해주는 거예요. 이런 걸 보면서 굉장히 많은 사람들, 뭐 10억이 넘는 사람들이 이 일들을 막 하게 됐죠. 
이 말도 물어보고 저 말도 물어보고 저 말도 물어보고 그런데 이 일이 어, 일반적인 그 단순한 호기심을 충족시키는 대화에서 끝나는 게 아니라 사람들이 일을 하는 방법도 영향을 주기 시작했습니다 그래서 오피스에서 사람들이 일을 할때 번역을 하거나 이메일에 초안을 만들거나 뭐 이런 일들이 있을 때쓸수 있게 된 거죠 그래서 LLM은 결과적으로 어, 우연에 의해서 굉장히 중요한 유저들을 찾았는데 그 LLM이 사용되는 것은 결국 뭐냐 하면 지식을 표현하는 도구가 된다는 겁니다 그리고 여기에 원더풀한 점은 아주 간단한 문제 다음 단어가 문제를 맞추는 문제를 가지고 이 모든 문제를 다풀수 있다는 데 도달하게 됐죠 여기까지는 사실 보면 테크놀로지 푸시에 해당합니다 사용자를 먼저 생각하고 기술을 만든 게 아니라 기술이 있었는데 그 기술이 우연히 좋은 사용자들을 만나게 된 거라고 볼수 있죠 다음 페이지 그러면 우리는 우리라고 하면 이제 삼성 세미컨덕터 우리 반도체를 만드는 사람들이 보기에는 이제는 LLM을 좀 다르게 볼 필요가 있다고 생각을 해요 기술은 어느 정도 만들어져 있기 때문에 유저 관점에서 사용자들이 어떤 것을 하고 싶은지 이 LLM을 가지고 어떤 일들을 해가지고 어떤 돈을 받을 수 있는지를 봐야 된다라는 게 저희 생각이고요 그리고 그 사용자들이 누구냐면 저 밑에 그림에 보시면 건물 몇 개가 보이잖아요 이게 반도체 공장인데 굉장히 큰 광도체 공장입니다 여기서는 몇만 명이 일을 하고 그리고 어. 뭐 조, 조 단위의 매출이 일어나는 곳이에요 굉장히 복잡한 곳이고 여기에서 수만 명의 엔지니어들이 일을 하는데 그 일을 하는 사람들이 어떻게 일을 하는지를 바라보는 겁니다 반도체에서 일하는 사람들은 크게 보면 지식과 정보를 가지고 일을 합니다 지식은 그 전까지 있었던 모든 뭐 관련된 정보 반도체는 이렇게 생산된다는 것 그리고 여기서는 어떤 시스템들이 작동을 한다는 것에 대한 지식들을 가지고 그 문서로 지, 축적되어 있는 지식을 활용하는 차원에서 이제 정, 접근을 하고요 두 번째는 지식만 가지고 일이 되는 게 아니라 지금 벌어지는 일들이 어떤 정보를 생성하는지 오늘은 무슨 일이 있었고 어제는 무슨 일이 있었는지에 대한 정보들을 기존에 있던 시스템들로부터 데이터를 가지고 와서 그걸 보면서 일을 하게 됩니다. 그러면 이런 정보를 조합해가지고 하는 일들을 결국 반도체 일은 뭐 기계로 열심히 일을 하는 일뿐만 아니라 굉장히 지식을 기반으로 한 knowledge intensive work이라고 할수 있고요. 이 일을 돕는데 우리가 외부에서 가져올 수 있는 LNM을 가탕으로 해서 삼성이 가지고 있는 지식을 집어넣은 LNN을 만들면 우리가 굉장히 어, 혁신적인 반도체를 만들고 그 반도체가 세상에 도움을 줄수 있을 것이다 라고 생각을 합니다 다음 페이지 그러면 결국 우리가 뭘 만들고 싶은 거냐면요 삼성 세미컨덕터를 위한 LNN을 만들고 싶은 거고요 이 LNN은 물론 학습을 할때 일반적인 지식도 학습을 하지만 반도체 생산 그리고 제조와 관련된 모든 인터널 데이터와 익스터널 데이터를 다 학습시키고 싶어 한 겁니다. 그리고 이렇게 만든 LLM은 아무 일이나 다 하려고 하는 게 아니라 그러니까 세상에 있는 모든 문제를 다 풀려고 하는 게 아니라 반도체를 설계하고 만들어내고 그리고 수율을 높이는 이런 특정한 테스크들에서 어떤 일들을 더 도와줄 수 있는지를 시나리오를 만들고 그 시나리오들을 잘 지원할 수 있는 툴이 되게끔 이 LLM을 만들려고 하는 것이고요. 이렇게 만들게 되는 LLM은 결과적으로 삼성이 가지고 있는 모든 지식을 축적한 핵심적인 자산이 되고 그것을 통해서 우리가 일을 하는 방법을 일깨우게 되는 핵심이 될 것이다 라고 이제 생각을 하고 있는 거고요 이러한 LLM은 어, 현재는 텍스트를 기반으로 만들고 있지만 앞으로는 멀티미디어 데이터를 서포트하게 될 것이고 그리고 어, 좀 전에 드, 드웨인 모닝 교수님이 말씀하셨던 여러 가지 그 작은 AI 모델들을 같이 묶어서 사용할 수 있는 커다란 센트럴 빅 브레인이 되게 만들겠다 라는 게 우리가 뭘 만들지에 대한 비전입니다 다음 페이지 그러면 이걸 어떻게 만드느냐 누가 만드느냐라고 생각해 보면요 사실 혼자 만들 수가 없습니다 어, 이런 LLM을 만들기 위해서는 굉장히 많은 GPU 컴퓨테이션이 필요하고 그리고 많은 데이터도 필요하고 그리고 연구원들의 그 지식과 경험도 많이 필요합니다 그래서 우리는 우리 세잇과 함께 삼성 리서치의 연구원들이 같이 모여서 하나의 모델을 만들고 기술을 했습니다 이 하나의 모델들을 프리트레인을 같이 해서 만들고 만들어진 프리트레인 모델을 어, 삼성 리서치는 DX 디비전에 가서 사용을 하고 세이트는 DS 디비전에서 사용하는 방식으로 파인튜닝을 별도로 하겠다는 게 현재 진행하고 있는 것이고요 어, 이 과정을 통해서 저희는 많은 것을 배웠고 그리고 이렇게 만들어진 LLM을 어, 어, 파인트링을 통해서 더 좋게 지금 만드는 중입니다 이렇게 만든 LLM은 하나의 모델이지만 그 LLM이 잘 사용되기 위해서는 두 가지의 컴포넌트들이 더 기술적으로 필요한데요 
한 가지 누리기는 LMM 에이전트라고 부르고 이 LMM 에이전트는 사용자와 효과적으로 인터페이스 하면서 우리가 원하는 유저 시나리오들을 접근할 수 있게도록 해주는 기능을 해주는 소프트웨어 시스템입니다. 그리고 LMM 플랫폼은 어, LLM이 한번 만들어지고 나서 끝나는 것이 아니라 새로운 데이터와 인포메이션이 들어오게 되면 그 데이터들을 자동으로 잘 학습하는 일들이 필요하고요. 그런 지속적으로 데이터를 학습해서 LLM을 가공시켜 나가는 모듈이 LLM 플랫폼이라고 저희는 부르고 있습니다. 다음. 자, 이렇게 만들면 좋죠? 지금 우리가 LLM을 만들고 계속 시스템을 만들어 나가고 있는데요. 지금까지 알려져 있는 모든 기술 그리고 뭐 논문에 발표되게 있는 기술만 가지면 우리가 하고 싶은 LLM이 다 만들어지느냐 그랬으면 좋겠지만 아직 남아있는 문제들, 해결해야 될 문제들이 굉장히 많이 있습니다. 그 중에서 몇 가지만 오늘 말씀을 드리고 여러분들이 그뭐 여기 학생분들도 많이 계시니까 앞으로 같이 연구를 해서 협력을 통해서 우리가 이 문제를 해결해 나가야 되는데요. 첫 번째 문제는 어, 데이터에 대한 보안성입니다. 어, 기본적으로 어, 인더스트리에서 만들고 있는 데이터는 그 자체가 외부의 보안이 유지가 되어야, 되어야 되는 데이터인 건 맞는데요. 근데 더 특이한 문제는 이 회사 안에서도 어떤 사람들은 이 데이터를 보고 어떤 사람들은 이 데이터를 볼수 없고 하는 구분들이 만들어질 수가 있습니다. 그런데 그 구분은 우리가 꼭 그렇게 하고 싶어서 하는 게 아니라 어, 비즈니스적인 요구에 의해서 어쩔 수 없이 일어나는 경우들이 많이 있거든요. 우리는 고객사들도 많이 있기 때문에 그러면 이 벽을 어떻게 만들 것인가 해서 굉장히 고민이 되죠. 사실은 따로따로 뭐 이 부서에 대한 모델 B 부서에 대한 모델, C 부서에 대한 모델을 따로따로 만들게 되면 컴퓨테이셜리티는 해결이 되겠죠. 하지만 거기 상태에서 세 가지 디파트먼트가 서로 가지고 있는 커먼한 애트리뷰트들을 모아가지고 학습할 수 경우에 나타나는 퍼포먼스의 향상을 기대할 수 없게 되는 문제가 생깁니다. 그래서 우리는 모든 데이터를 다 모아서 하나의 모델로 학습을 하고 대신에 보안을 유지기, 유지하기 위한 다른 방법을 만들어야 될 필요가 있습니다. 예를 들어서 어떤 질문이 들어오면 이 질문은 대답을 안 해준다든지 아니면 특정한 답변이 만들어지고 할때이 답변은 이, 이 사람에게 적합하지 않은 답변이기 때문에 막아야 된다든지 하는 필터링 메커니즘을 우리가 만들어야 될 필요가 있습니다. 그리고 기본적으로 많이 사용되고 있는 어, 문서를 리트리브하고 그 문서에 의해서 대답을 만들어내는 리트리브 오그멘트 제너레이션을 사용하는데 이때 사용되는 도큐멘트들이 특정 디파트먼트의 컨텐츠 문서들만 리트리브 되도록 만들 수 있게 되겠죠. 두 번째로 꼽을 수 있는 문제는 이 LMM이 지금은 텍스트를 사용하는 문제들에 많이 사용되고 있습니다. 뭐 내가 지금 궁금한 것이 무엇이냐 그리고 내가 이 상태에서 어떤 일을 하면 되느냐는 질문을 하게 될 텐데요. 그런데 LMM이 텍스트가 아니라 다른 일들도 할수 있게 된다면 굉장히 많은 일들을 할 수가 있겠죠. 아까 언급된 퍼포먼 퍼포머라는 논문에서 얘기 되는 것처럼 LMM이 가지고 있는 컴퓨테이셔널 케이퍼빌리티가 어, 텍스트가 아닌 다른 모델의 데이터에 대해서도 프리딕션을 굉장히 잘해낼 수 있게 된다면 굉장히 도움이 되는데 그 이유는 이 프리딕션 모델이 어, 유니버설 트랜스퍼 러닝을 가능하게 하기 위한 모델로 사용될 수가 있을 거라는 겁니다. 즉 어, 장비가 바뀌고 그 장비에서 일어나는 어, 시츄에이션들이 바뀌었을 때 기존에 배워 다른 문제들로부터 배웠던 지식을 가지고 그 지식이 녹아진 상태에서 이 문제를 빨리 풀수 있게 되면 데이터의 부족 문제와 컨셉 드리프트 문제를 근본적으로 해결할 수 있게 되지 않을까 하는 것이죠. 그래서 프리딕션을 위한 LMM을 활용에 대해서는 앞으로 연구를 해야 될 부분이 많이 있습니다. 다음 페이지. 마지막으로 만들, 어, 만들고자 하는 것은 물론 많은 분들이 얘기하고 있는, 얘기하시는 멀티모달 익스펜션입니다. 지금 뭐 GPT-4V에서 나오는 것처럼 이미지를 가지고 와서 이미지를 이해하고 이미지를 만들어내는 기술들이 많이 만들어지고 있는데요. 이미지 이외에도 어, 반도체를 만들기 위해서 사용되는 더 많은 데이터들이 있습니다. 뭐 디지털 회로라든지 아니면 굉장히 길, 긴 타임 시리즈 데이터라든지 이런 데이터를 효과적으로 배우고 그 안에서 일반적인 법칙을 배운 후에 사용자에게 적절한 해결책을 제시해주는 이런 모델을 만들고자 하는 것입니다. 이럴 때 어떤 구조의 멀티모델 러닝이 가장 중요한 것인지에 대해서는 앞으로 더 지속적으로 좀더 연구를 해야 되는 상태입니다. 어, 이 정도로 제가 오늘 발표 드릴 것은 마치고요. 그 이번 세션에서 일어나는 모든 톡에 대해서 어, 패널 디스커션 시간에 질문과 응답을 받, 받으려고 하니까 지금은 여기서 끝내도록 하고 패널 디스커션에서 다시 뵙도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much, VP of Technology, for the great presentation. Let's continue with the second presentation, which will be delivered by Che Jun Han, VP of Technology, SAITS. And he'll be talking about the foundation models and industrial computer vision applications. So please come forward to the stage.
Jae Jun Han, VP of Technology. You have the floor. Please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jae Jun Han from SEIT. I will present my material in Korean as well uh, on behalf of Korean audience. 안녕하세요. 세이트 uh, 한재준입니다. 발표를 시작하겠습니다. 요즘 채찌 피트를 대변하는 라지 동기지 모델이 크게 각광을 받고 있는데요. 저는 컴퓨터 비전에서 파운데이션 모델 그 중에 자율주행이 어떤 의미를 갖고 있는지 여러분과 얘기를 나누고자 합니다. 자율주행 기술은 교통사고 예방뿐만이 아니라 우리의 삶과 세상을 변화시킬 거라고 생각하는데요. 10년 전 예측에는 이제쯤 완전 자율주행이 어, 실현될 줄 알았지만 현실은 그렇지 않습니다. 2023년 현재 자동차 제조사들은 어, 운영 그 도메인에서 어, 제한된 영역에서 레벨 2나 3 정도를 제공하고 있고요. 로봇 택시의 경우에도 더욱더 제한된 영역에서 레벨 4 서비스를 제공하고 있습니다. 그렇다면 왜 우리 기대와는 다르게 자율주행 발전이 더디게 될까요? 구체적으로 레벨 4 자율주행에서 어, 어떤 챌린지가 있는지 데이터와 알고리즘 측면에서 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 데이터 관점에서는 정말 많은 데이터가 필요합니다. 다양한, 다양한 어, 어떤 환경도 커버를 해야 되고 또한 흔하지 않은 데이, 흔하지 않은 시나리오에서의 데이터를 모으는 것은 정말 어려운 일입니다. 또한 이제 알고리즘 측면에서 살펴보면 은 사전, 사전에 학습되지 않은 어떤 상황을 맞이하게 되면 대응이 어렵게 되고요. 그래서 로봇 택시 서비스의 경우에는 비상 상황에 원격으로 오퍼레이터가 대신 운전해 주는 방법을 사용하기도 합니다. 또한 자율주행의 운행 의도를 설명하지 못하고 어, 사용자의 신뢰를 주지 못하는 점들도 가장 큰 문제라고 할수 있습니다. 요약해 보면 방대한 방대하고 다양한 데이터를 수집해야 되는 것 그리고 특이한 경우에 대한 대처 그리고 사용자의 신뢰를 증진하는 것이 필요하다고 할수 있겠습니다. 다음은 자율주행 기사에 대형 자율주행 관련된 기사인데요. 보시다시피 샌프란시스코 레벨 4 로봇 택시 서비스는 다양한 문제를 직면하고 있습니다. 마르지 않은 콘크리트 도로를 들어가서 멈추기도 하고 진입 금지라고 하는 표시를 무시하고 교통 정체를 일으키기도 하면서 보행자 사고를 일으키기도 합니다. 이로 인해서 이번 10월에 서비스가 중단되기도 했습니다. 이러한 사고를 살펴보면 사용자 사람에게는 사소해 보이는 상황이 어려움을 겪을 수 있다고 하는 것을 보여줄 수 있, 보여줍니다. 이런 문제를 극복하기 위해서 조금 더 사람 지능에 대해서 좀 살펴보도록 하겠습니다. 아, 제가 주목한 것은 하워드 가드너의 멀티플 인텔리전스에 대한 내용입니다. 멀티플 인텔리전스 티어리에 의하면 사람은 하나의 일반적인 지능을 갖고 있는 것이 아니라 다양한 종류의 지능을 가지고 있다고 정의하고 있습니다. 총 8개의 지능이 있다고 이야기하고 있는데요. 그 근거는 사람이 언어 중추의 뇌손상을 입더라도 말을 못하게 될뿐 운동하는 데는 지장이 없다는 것입니다. 저는 이 중에 비주얼 스페이셜 인텔리전스에 좀 초점을 맞춰봤습니다. 비주얼 스페이셜 인텔리전스란 물체 그리고 물체 간의 관계를 이해하는 것에 그치는 것이 아니라 시각화하고 생성할 수 있는 능력이라고 정의를 하고 있습니다. 다시 자율주행으로 돌아가서 생각을 해보면 사람은 세상에 대한 지식을 갖고 있습니다. 아까 전에 많은 연사분들이 얘기했던 월드 모델이라고 얘기할 수가 있는데요. 운전을 연습하면서 운전에 대한 능력을 습득하고 운전에 대한 상식, 지식을 가지게 되는 것이죠. 이거를 어, 다시 한번 말씀드리죠. 월드 모델이라고 합니다. 그래서 사람들은 생소한 상황에서 어떻게 해결할지 방안을 모색하게 됩니다. 인지과학 이론에 따르면 Perception, Prediction, Action Cycle을 통해서 사람은 지속적으로 학습한다고 합니다. 어떤 상황이 나왔을 때 인지를 하고 그 다음에 어떤 내가 액션을 했을 때 어떤 어, 상황이 일어날지 Prediction을 하는 겁니다. 그걸 통해서 사람이 행동을 하게 되는 거죠. 이런 사이클을 통해서 결과를 살펴보고 지속적으로 월드 모델을 강화하고 변형해 나갑니다. 튜링 어워드 위너이신 
어, 연니콘 박사도 기계가 자율지능을 얻기 위해서는 월드 모델에 대한 시뮬레이션이 중요하다고 언급을 하고 있습니다. 또한 인간과 유사한 지능을 달성하기 위해서는 멀티모달 입력 간의 상관관계를 잘 학습하도록 데이터가 구비가 돼야 됩니다. 이러한 데이터를 활용하게 되면 다양한 입력이 어댑트돼서 통합된 인베딩 스페이스를 구성할 수 있는 AI 모델을 만들 수 있습니다. 아래의 그림과 같이 해변가의 그림, 사진을 보면 사람들은 바다의 소리를 연상하고 해변에 부는, 부는 바람, 모래의 촉감, 해변에 대한 노래까지도 연상하듯이 말이죠. 그래서 인간 수준의 AI를 달성하기 위해서는 언어 모델뿐만이 아니라 비주얼 스페이셜 인텔리전스 모델도 모델도 함께 통합해서 개발을 하는 것이 필요합니다. 이는 첫 번째로 언어에 대한 시각적인 그라운드를 제공할 뿐만이 아니라 설명과 이해, 그리고 미래에 대한 예측, 그리고 미래에 대해서 어떤 액션을 취해야든지 알게 하는 것이라고 생각합니다. 세이트에서는 자율주행을 위한 월드 모델 또는 드라이빙 파운데이션 모델을 개발할 예정입니다. 이 모델은 카메라, 라이다, 레이더 같은 멀티모델 센서를, 센서뿐만이 아니라 운전에 대한 액션, 핸들을 돌린다든지 가속 감, 감속의 페달을 받는 등의 행위를 입력으로 해서 파운데이션 모델을 통해 미래에 대한 주행 상황을 예측하고 그, 그에 맞도록 어떻게 운전해야 되는지를 예측하는 연구입니다. 저는 이러한 파운데이션 모델을 학습하게 되면 주행 시 알아야 될 물리법칙 그리고 액션에 대한 사유를 알아내는 인간관계를 추전, 추론하는 능력이 그 모델 내에서 자체적으로 생각, 생성될 거라고 생각합니다. 이 파운데이션 모델을 통해서 지금 자율주행이 가지고 있는 여러 가지 문제 방대한 양의 데이터를 수집해야 되는 이슈 특이한 상황에 대처되는 이슈들이 많이 해소돼서 지금 많이 잃어버린 사용자의 신뢰를 높일 수 있는 방법이라고 생각합니다. 감사합니다. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe we have more talks during the panel discussions. And now the final presentation of the second session will be held by uh, Junheng Lee, VP of Technology, SAIT. And uh, the theme of the presentation will be a glimpse into an AI-driven future of semiconductor manufacturing. So without further ado, please welcome me with a big round of applause. Thank you very much for the great introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. In this talk, uh, I'm going to guide you into the future and help you imagine what future semiconductor manufacturing will look like. Semiconductor manufacturing is a marvel of modern engineering involving a thousand intricate fabrication steps to create nanometer scale structures. A 12-inch silicon wafer holds trillions of these tiny structures with each process step carefully crafted. The entire journey from a bare wafer to functional chip typically spans three to six months. So what is semiconductor manufacturing in essence? is as simple as this. Each the process crafting silicon chips to meet specific product requirement. Digging one step deeper, the process can be divided into two core phases, design and fabrication. Within the design phase, the process branches into several sub-processes, such as high-level design, logic design, physical design, and mask design. Further iteration of breaking down these sub-steps sub will soon create numerous fine-grained design steps. Similarly, the fabrication is a lengthy sequence of 
various processes, including photolithography, etching, and many others. Combining those elemental fat processes, the whole sequence can exceed easily a thousand steps. Now, the problem is, how do you optimize this vast sequence of processes? Currently, we are employing a well-known strategy called divide and conquer. We break down the process into as small steps as possible, and then set target spec for each step to manipulate them separately. Then we optimize them locally in parallel. After the local, after the local optimization, the process is further refined on a global scale. We repeat this alternative local and global optimization until we get to the target level of optimization. The same strategy applies to design phase. OK, now let's move our attention to semiconductor technology trend. We witness continuous reduction in technology node size year after year, while transistor count continues to surge. As technology advances, challenges mount. Process margin has been shrinking to the level we cannot make it without spending a lot of effort and cost. On the other hand, design complexity, design complexity is ever increasing to meet customer requirement. As a result, the number of fair process steps is growing annually. To simplify the situation we got, um, let's imagine finding the best path from the start to the destination. From the starting point, there might be several paths to reach the destination. Some of them will lead us to the destination, while others that look promising might lead us astray. Let's apply the same strategy here to find the best path. By setting some target specs along the way and optimizing them locally, we hope to reach the global optimum path. But if some target specs are misguided, then local optimization won't lead us to the global optimum. We will waste time and resource shifting target specs and repeating local optimization to find the best path. Even when we find the optimal path, we still have a problem. We have to take a significant human effort to ensure that the all steps operate in the predefined process margin. The situation is getting worse every year. Since the process margin is shrinking, and the number of steps are increasing. So, what can we do? Can AI help us to solve this problem? Let's explore how AI will revolutionize our work in the future. We are going to have a strong semiconductor foundation model that learns almost all available knowledge about semiconductors from external and internal sources. We are expecting it will cover all manufacturing and R&D-related tasks and orchestrate with conventional tools, task-specific AI models, and legacy systems as well. We humans will seamlessly interact with numerous tools and facts through the foundation model without learning details of how to use them. So let's go get back to this um, unfolded process of semiconductor manufacturing 
and see how AI will transform this complicated and lengthy uh, process in the future. Thanks to AI, many things we cannot do currently will be possible in the future. For example, controlling quality in wave-polarbelt granularity, maintaining individual equipment based on prediction, changing plant production schedule dynamically will be realized. Yield analysis and ramp-up using intelligent process optimization will be available too. All those changes will virtually consolidate the, this lengthy sequence of fair processes and make it look like a single process. We call it autonomous fat. Likewise, complicated design process can be, will be merged into a single process thanks to AI specialized for generation and optimization of design. We call it generative design. Eventually, we'll be able to automate the whole process by combining the generative design and the autonomous fab through the design technology co-optimization, scheme generation, and new material discovery. Finally, we are back to this simple process. With the AI in the middle, we humans will take care of only product requirement and the final product. In other words, we are going to have an AI that produces a product from the text we give. We call it text to product. And this is the future of semiconductor manufacturing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee, uh, for that great presentation. There was a glimpse into uh, the AI-driven future of semiconductor manufacturing. As that was very informative, actually, and I learned a lot and enjoyed a lot. Thank you very much once again. Well, um, so now we're almost, uh, we almost come to an end of the Samsung AI Forum 2023. So please confirm if all participants have submitted their votes for the post session. And please remember that this lucky draw is exclusively for those participating in the poster session. And we have a fantastic Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 5 of four graphs, so we can definitely look forward to it. And we appreciate your support until the very end of our forum. Uh, and now we'll be holding a panel discussion. Our stage is now getting ready for this time uh, with uh, Kimi Lee, Yang Sang Choi, and Lady Zinik, and Dwayne Boning, and Jae Jun Han, and Jun Hang Lee, uh, all those speakers that we already um, met uh, in the previous session. So uh, if the stage is ready, I would like to invite all the uh, panelists uh, as well as our moderator for this time. Well, Samsung AI Forum uh, 2023 with the theme of a larger scale AI for a better tomorrow. So we have journeyed through a day of field with insights, captivating presentation and engagement interactions and sharing of the best practice in this uh, forum. So we uh, have a wonderful panel discussion ahead, which marks the, uh, the final program of the day. So yes, our speakers are now ready for uh, their turn, so please wait a moment. And once again, after this apparent discussion, uh, we'll have the final remarks from all of our uh, hosts, and finally, there will be a Lucky Drew event. So once again, thank you very much. So yeah, I will quickly ask you to come up to the stage, our moderator and speakers. Please be seated on stage. 
So now, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we give them a big round of applause for the last program panel discussions. Mr. Young Sang Choi, please lead the session. Okay, uh, so we're gonna start with some questions if you have anyone, because we didn't have much time in question answering session in this afternoon session. So if anyone have any question to ask about specific talk or in general, uh, please raise your hand or just stand up to get some attention. Mm, okay. And before anyone has a strong mind to set up, get up and raise a hand, we will start with our pre-selected discussion topic. So all, all the panels, you see that the discussion topics there and we will start with some talk about that. So the first question I have is that do you believe large multimodal model or large language model will lead the way to artificial general intelligence? Yes or no? And if yes, what would be the missing link to the way of artificial general intelligence? Do you have an idea? Uh, yes. I do think that LLM or you know, language multimodal model will lead to the AGI because Actually, many intellectual tasks like solving a math problem, coding, and so forth are based on the text. So if we understand the text, I do think that there is the one way to go to the AGI. I don't know how to define the AGI, to be honest, but uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's my thoughts. And uh, current missing link but would be the, the physical interaction with the real world. Like, you know, currently it is, everything is on the software, you know, it, it cannot be uh, interact with the uh, you know, real world environments. So <clears throat> I think robotics is the good, you know, missing link, can, you know, fill out this, you know, lack of the ability. And by communicating with, the, by combining robotics and the language model, I think there is a high chance to get a AGI in my opinion. But I'd like to also hear other, other guys' thoughts on this question. Any other better opinion, <laughs> Larry? Um, okay. I would say no. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> the, so when we think about larger language models, they're really you know, pattern matchers. They're looking at text out there. They're trying to reason about uh, the tokens that they've seen. But what we don't see is AIs that can reason as well as humans, AIs that can take in the small amount of information that we have available to us and be able to synthesize from that and be able to generalize from that and to be able to um, you know, just reason in the same way that we see humans do. Like a good example of that, I think, is, is playing chess. You know, we have superhuman chess bots out there, right? But do we have a chess bot out there that can learn from the same amount of data that a human gets? No. So I think for AGI really to be successful is we need new learning algorithms that are much more data efficient and that generalize and reason much better. Uh, I, I totally agree with Larry. Uh, I think the LLM is a very complex pattern matching algorithm uh, with a large amount of data, which also has some, uh, some kind of reasoning provided by human. That's why we think that it seems like uh, reasoning by itself, but in reality, it is uh, just uh, giving you some kind of reason, uh, reason-like answer. So I think we need to still uh, develop some kind of reasoning uh, method provided uh, with the large language model to reach the general AI. Dr. Poning? So I, I would say Yes, in the sense that I think the large language models are leading the way, but I agree with the same points already. It's, it's sort of like you know the leader, but then you need all of the other 20 pieces of the whole team. And right now, we don't have all those other 20 pieces, right? So I, I think... Uh, the large language models are leading us in, in new directions, but we're going to have to add so many other mechanisms and learning algorithms uh, to them that it will be a, a, a very exciting time. Well, I think uh, we are already 
we're almost there. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it fairly depends on what level we are expecting from the term general, right? So if we are interested in AI that can address um, quite general tasks across uh, various domains, I think uh, we are almost there. But you are, we are expecting something like a human, maybe we have a long way to go. So I don't know if we can define the human intelligence at this moment. So there are many debates across all over the world. What is um, human intelligence? It's a long, long history, actually. So I'm not sure we can even reach the human intelligence, but if the general intelligence is just mean that uh, addressing general tasks, I think it's almost, we're almost there. Yeah, we heard about different opinions. I think that we don't have to have a consensus on this important matter. And it's, it was great to listen to different point of view. Uh, one point I want to add is that I agree with Jason's point that it's a very big pattern matcher. But isn't it true for humans too? Are we more than a pattern matcher? And in that case, what is the missing thing which is better than pattern matcher as a human beings have? So that will be an open question we can resolve. Uh, as the discussion is going on, if you have any questions related with it or with the, with the uh, previous talks, please raise your hand and get my attention to give you a chance to talk something, okay? Uh, before we get any question, we will go to the, the second discussion topic I preselected. Um, it's actually, it's covered by Yoshua Benjo in the early morning, but we can still talk more about that. What is the potential risks of LLM and LMM anyway? How can you solve it? Is it maybe it's kind of a small problem or the existential threat for as a human race? Can we imagine what kind of risks will be there? Maybe Dr. Boning has some idea. Uh, so one, one element that wasn't discussed a little bit uh, this, this morning is around the displacement of jobs, uh, the, the potential risks of using large language models and more broadly AI development in ways that actually don't benefit everybody or don't benefit uh, society. So, for example, a focus on automation that replaces human activity uh, leads to potential unemployment. Uh, the development of AI methods that lead to more surveillance uh, is very, can potentially be quite counterproductive. So there's ways that we might choose to go in different directions uh, and look at development of an application of AI that pairs with humans, creates new kinds of human activities, enables human uh, capabilities that, and new kinds of jobs. That is a very, very different direction. So I think it's not just large language models, it's more of you know, how we choose to develop and, and deploy AI. And the default mechanisms, the default incentives right now are not looking good. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I think there needs to be a little bit more of the, uh, I guess I would say societal, uh, political, the engagement uh, across industry, government, and so on, trying to think about where we want these technologies to go and who we want it to benefit because the sort of default focus, uh, you know, which is very, you know, uh, profit oriented, which is a good thing too, but you can make money in targeting other ways. So, so I'd, I'd just add that as kind of a different kind of risk, uh, which is a little different than, you know, um, uh, an AI taking over the world or something, but it's displacing slowly. So, 
I think one distinction that's important to make is when we think about large language models and what are the harms, it's, it's not the Terminator scenarios. It's not the, these, these more dramatic kind of sci-fi type of problems that people a lot, of times, a lot of times think about, you know, when they think about, you know, how Hollywood is kind of dramatized AI. I, I think it's much more mundane. You know, it's, uh, you know, our chatbots, it's not that they're not truthful, it's just they don't know when they're telling the truth. Uh, you know, that is a problem. Misinformation is a problem. I think the way you should, at least the way that I think about it, is if you put this technology into the hands of a bad actor, or somebody who wants to manipulate uh, people, you know, that becomes a problem. Uh, and like I said, misinformation, that sort of thing, is a problem. And as far as solutions, I think we need to figure out ways to open up the, the window or like have AI be able to say, okay, I'm telling you X because I saw Y, you know, to show you where its truth is coming from. Uh, so that way we don't, we don't have negative feedback cycles where the AI says X, um, a lot of people quote X and then it learns from X and then it believes X even more strongly. Uh, and I th we had talks today on that where it's, you know, increasing, uh, you know, biases and that sort of thing. So I think we need to be really cognizant of that feedback loop. Okay, let's move on to, uh, so what achievements in AI was the most great other than LMM? So <laughs> you know, we, we saw a lot of news from large language models, but there should be another area, other areas of achievements in AI in 2023. Do you have anything to know about that? <laughs> Kim in? Uh, I would say AI for science is the also most significant progress in the AI. Uh, I think Lady already covered a very interesting, I uh, shared the interesting progress in that direction, but that, you know, even beyond that, IPA port and uh, actually many people are working on applying AI for scientific discovery. And uh, that's the, uh, I think, you know, one of the biggest, you know, progress in the AI. And uh, I, yeah, that's the very important direction to go, in my opinion. Uh, one of the most, if you ask me what was the most surprising thing I, I saw this year is uh, if anybody knows of the work of um, Deepak Parthik of CMU on the robotic, they have the robotic dog doing parkour and they can basically teach this robotic dog in simulation how to move around and then they put it into the real world and it can do these amazing things. It just looks so lifelike. I was just surprised at how much they could learn just through simulation. Uh, and that, that was something that I found really surprising this year. That's great. So people other than LLM researchers are doing something in this year, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go. What? So it is a somewhat fundamental question, like what is your top remain, remaining problem, which is not solved yet in machine learning. For me, is a domain adaptation or out of domain data generalization. It is still not there for a very efficient solution for that. But I don't have an answer, but do you have any ideas about the, the remaining problems, the important problems in machine learning? Well, um, many speakers uh, pointed out reasoning is the next uh, problem we have to um, handle. But I think uh, we have to uh, find out how to uh, train AI to understand the world in a uh, law of physics. And yeah, law of physics. So it, 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 the physics is the um, fundamental law. Um, well, govern the real world. So to have the uh, AI really understand the uh, world and have a good generalization ability, we have to have some AI that can learn um, physics from the data. If I add to that, I, I think the embodied AI would be the next thing that we need to concentrate. Uh, because the LLM is mostly focusing on the 
text domain, but it's a kind of abstract area, uh, abstract uh, data set, which is not connected to the, directly to the world. So, I mean, if we connect using sensors and actuators, like he said, I mean, that would be quite interesting to see what would AI could do. I would say three things. Uh, modeling of atoms, of course, I have to say that. Uh, but the other two is being able to learn from a small amount of data. Uh, I think framing that problem is really important right now, and, and that's something that I think as a community we need to work on, is how do we frame that problem so that way we can make progress in that space. And then the final one is modeling uncertainty. We need to know when our models are wrong. That's true in you know, the area that I work on, modeling of atoms. It's true for large language models. It's true for many different applications. We need our models to be self-aware of their mistakes. In some sense, I, I think, going back to my earlier comments, I've been educated by some of my colleagues at MIT that maybe the biggest problem is not the technology, it's where we want the technology to go. So it's what are the problems that AI can attack that augment all of us, not uh, you know replace all of us. I mean, I think there's great problems, uh, important problems like uh, climate. That's a that's an existential problem, right? So how do we how do we target things in, in, in those directions? So and that will then lead the need for invention of new technology aspects of AI. It'll focus, uh, you know, what are the big remaining learning problems or or, or whatnot. But but in in some sense, uh, kind of strange to be saying in a technology kind of forum. But the the, the problem somehow is more than the technology. Uh, for me, uh, I think more parameter efficient neural network is important. So currently, our model is too big, in my opinion, and the training them definitely you know, require a lot of memory and the computation. And this, everything is the problem. So I think making more smaller but stronger model is quite important, especially if you think about uh, you know, putting our LLM to the, you know, our phone, definitely we should make a much more smaller model you know, to de deploy this model to the, our phone. So <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, st you know, studying some parameter efficient you know, machine learning or designing such architecture would be very impactful. Uh, for the maybe next two years. Yeah, yeah. I want to add one more thing for this still very difficult problem is that the existence of biologically plausible or biologically feasible machine learning mechanisms. As you know, backpropagation is not there in the human body or any animals, and backpropagation has an inherent uh, waste of energy because it has a trial and error. And if we can learn without backpropagation and getting some very few examples to learn like animals do, in that case, we can solve this power consumption problem, maybe. Uh, how long do we have more time? What time is it? We have uh, 11 minutes. Oh, no, no, we actually, we, our schedule was lagged behind because, so maybe we can go one more topic and wrap up this panel discussion. So, could you change to the next question? Yeah, this is already talked by Jun Heng about this, the ideal model of AI in the manufacturing. So, can you add some more ideas on it, uh, Dr. Boning? The ideal state of AI in manufacturing? Well, I, I liked the vision because so much of it, uh, you know, involved, still involved people. You know, people uh, engaged in the design, uh, people engaged in uh, the, the, the process optimization, and so on. It, it is end to end, but I think there's still people uh, in, in the middle. 
you know, the, the nightmare scenario in, in manufacturing is the old joke of uh, the factory of the future will have one human operator and a dog. The job of the human operator is to uh, feed the dog. The job of the dog is to make sure that the human doesn't touch the factory. So that's not the future vision of AI in manufacturing that I want to see. Uh, I like the idea of finding ways to continue to engage the creativity of humans in making new kinds of products, making new kinds of uh, 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 manufacturing processes, but with the, with the aid of uh, AI. I, I, I to totally agree with you. So um, when I uh, talk about um, text to product, I actually imagine that the manufacturing itself will be um, operating by itself, and uh, what would uh, uh, people, human beings, uh, uh, do actually? <laughs> and my answer is that um, we are going to have a very good platform, manufacturing platform, actually, and um, people will work more independently and autonomously. It's something like a one-person business unit. So each person will create an idea, come up with an idea for a product, and it will ask the platform to make it. And then it can uh, actually, we, the, the semiconductor um, business is a uh, um, mass product uh, uh, business, but it will um, uh, change it to um, a small quantity, but a variety of uh, product. So we will, we will still need many people to uh, make our business. Okay, so because we are take so long time on these sessions and in the afternoon, let's wrap up this panel discussion and thank you for the older panelists and the older audiences for this discussion time. Thank you. What a wonderful panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, though it's uh, running out of time, that was very great panel discussion. That was very heated discussion as well. Thank you very much all the speakers uh, and moderator for your effort. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this Congress all prepared a session and I uh, was almost missed at the final uh, feature program of the Samsung AI Forum 2023. At the final part of the AI Challenge will be held now. Samsung AI Challenge Award is an event to revitalize domestic research and nurture AI talent. The Samsung AI Challenge is a competing conducted for domestic university and graduate students and many uh, participants apply every year. Uh, and the AI challenge is uh, judged on three topics, the development of the domain adaptive sem uh, semantic uh, segmentation algorithm that is robust to changes in camera characteristics, and the development of the machine learning force field algorithm for a semiconductor material uh, simulation and the development of an algorithm that simultaneously generates quantitative evaluation of camera image quality and qualitative evaluation of natural language. So in each category, one team was selected for first and second place, and two teams were chosen for uh, the uh, third place. And each team is awarded their certificate and prize money, and for the first place team, 10 million won, for the second team, 5 million won, and for the third team, 3 million won each team. Once again, congratulations. So now we'll announce the winners of the development of an algorithm that simultaneously generates a quantitative evaluation of a camera image quality and qualitative evaluation of natural language.
So now we would like to ask the uh, Chang Yu Choi Corporate AVP of Samsung Electronics to assist with the awards. So let's first welcome him to the stage. And first place is Seoul National University. Congratulations. And second place is Korea University. And the third place are Korean University and Postec. So please come up to the stage, the winners of the first category, the development of the domain adaptive uh, semantic segmentation algorithm that is robust to exchanges in camera characteristic. So first place goes to Seoul National University. Congratulations. The corporate EVP, please. The 여러분 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 네, 시상금과 함께 1등 서울 National University and second place as Korean University. 네, 고려대학교 앞으로 나와주시고요. 네, 역시 진심으로 축하드립니다. 네, 상장과 상금 모두를 전달해 주시겠습니다. Yes. 자, 그리고 이제 3등으로 가볼 거예요. 3등은 고려대학교. 네, 뛰어난 성적을 거두었습니다. 진심으로 축하드립니다. 그리고 네, 역시 상금 모두 함께 주시고요. 그리고 포스텍입니다. 역시 정말 치열한 경쟁을 뚫고 오늘 좋은 성적을 거두었습니다. 진심으로 축하드립니다. 자, 이제 다 함께 기념 사진 촬영을 하도록 하겠습니다. 네. Please look at the camera and take a pose. 여러분 다시 한번 큰 박수로 축하를 해 주시기 바랍니다. 컨그라츄레이션스 자, 이제 자리로 모시도록 하겠습니다. 화면을 통해서 소상자를 만나보시기 바랍니다. So first place goes to POSEC. And the second place is the Seoul National University. And the third place is the Songyunwan University and Hosek. So I would like to invite all the winners to the stage. Please give them another big round of applause. Yes, so the first place goes to Postec. 네, Postec 앞으로 나와주십시오. Postec부터 시상하도록 하겠습니다. 네, 상장 전달해 주시기 바랍니다. 그리고 상금 모드도 함께 증정하도록 하겠습니다. 여러분 큰 박수로 축하해 주십시오. 그리고 두 번째, 2등은 서울대학교입니다. 네, 역시 상금 모드와 함께 상장 전달해 주고 계시고요. 그리고 3등 성균관 유니버시티 성균관 대학교입니다. 네, 계속해서 사장님 함께 전달해 주고 계십니다. 그리고 포스트까지 네. 트리 미니포 타임. So we're going to have a group photo session. Yeah, let's put on big smile. Great job. Congratulations once again. 네, 자, 이제 자리로 모시도록 하겠습니다. So now you may return to your seats. And last but not least, so we're going to meet the winners and the development of the domain adaptive semantic segmentation algorithm 
that is robots to changes in the camera characteristics section. So let's bring them on to the stage. The first place is Seoul National University of Science and Technology. Congratulations. Second place is Hakmat University. And the third place are Gyeonggi University and Korea University. So let's give them a big round of applause as they come up to the stage. So, so first place goes to Seoul National University of Science and Technology. Second place is Hanbat University. Congratulations. 네, 순차적으로 2위, 3위 계속해서 시상하도록 하겠습니다. So each team is awarded a certificate and prize money. The first place team, 10 million won. Second team, 5 million won. And third team, 3 million won each team. So once again, the third place is Gyeonggi University and Korea University. Congratulations. So let's have a commemorative photo session together. So I look forward to your great performance in the new future. 다시 한번 큰 박수로 축하해 주시기 바랍니다. Another big round of applause. Congratulations to all winners of the AI Challenge. Now you may return to your seats. And now, corporate EBP will now give us the closing remarks. So we'll give you the microphone. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, please give him a big round of applause. Hello, good afternoon. Um, this is Changyu. Uh, I'm in charge of AI Research Center and uh, Green Spot Computer Project in SAIT. Uh, as we bring our AI forum uh, to a close, we once again thank you for being here with us today. As I hope that uh, this event has given you a deep understanding of AI and in industry. Uh, yeah, I'm convinced that we can go further and achieve more. And I'd like to conclude by emphasizing the need for partnership to better engage with each other and to deliver transformative impacts at scale in the future. Thank you very much. 네, 부사장님 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Chair Chang Yu, Corporate VP, EVP for your hard work and your warm closing remarks. Thank you very much. So now, all the sessions and all the events of the 2023 Samsung AI Forum are concluded.